Greetings, and welcome back to Stellaris, my Commonwealth of Man playthrough. I noticed another mercenary company I had overlooked here in Vilth. The Manticore's Armada. So we will be shifting the Vilth station away from being a shipyard and to an anchorage. And that means that... Strike Force Bunyip will need to be relocated. Now, when I retake Lotrepian domains, there are a lot of gateways where I can build stations to relocate Centaur and Bunyip, and I'll have to create a few new ones as well. New species variant available. There are a few more young Furbanites to shift over. We are currently in breach of Galactic. Community. Now, if I go to res uh, to edicts, I thought I saw an icon up there when I clicked on it. We are in breach of this resolution, the Non-Interference Act. Technically, I'm not in breach. I'm in breach because of an event. So now, let us go to the galactic community and see what our modifiers are. Minus 30% monthly unity. Ooh. That's going to be six points. Uh, diplomatic agreement upkeep is increased. I only have two diplomatic agreements. I have a commercial pact and envoys. Actually, the commercial pact may not, may be the only one. The envoy may not be affected. My naval capacity is dropped by 10%. That's going to create a problem. Diplomatic weight from fleet power, research speed, and diplomatic weight from tech are all affected. So I had more than both of them combined. Combined, they were 386. I was 500. We'll see what happens in a month. But since the young Furbanite has switched over, there's another one that I was going to convert. I need to go down to the entry for the Dorbalans. Select Smolan. On Era Ovis, I'm switching all of the Swedelands and Arintho Rincholans over to Similans because I am preparing to shift it fully to industry in preparation to become a Ecumenopolis. An Ecumenopolis. Takes forever to navigate this list. I mean, I could use the scroll bar on the side, but chances are I would overshoot. Alright, Ira Ovis had seven Arintho Rincholans and only one Swedelin. And that will take one more month, so it will be done February 2nd. And a handful more days. Maybe close to a month. I should be done with the gateway site with the Ikinga. I can jump them out and head them to Helio, uh, Helos in preparation to build the... Ships refitted. Shipyard. Alright, Strike Force Minotaur has been refitted to the Minotaur Calf. For some reason, I had originally designed the ship as the Minotaur Cub, but that's not the way you uh, talk about young cows. So we have the Minotaur Calf, which is a point defense vessel with autocannons. And the only other ship, it's actually easier to do this way. If we go back to... Strike Force Minotaur and go to the Fleet Manager. Is a cruiser in here. And the cruisers are torpedo vessels, much akin to. They're almost identical, honestly, to Strike Force Pegasus, except for the combat computer. Instead of having a torpedo combat computer, it has a picket so that it has more tracking and a faster rate of fire. So instead of doing strafing runs, it will just come up into medium range and continue to pelt.
Zoblar 3 has been swept of all life. So now I can redo these orders so that I will end up skipping the capital. We're going to bathe Weir Prime and then proceed to Nathupta, Nathupa, and finally to Breslin. And we're leaving Kebduran to be invaded. That's going to take a while to uh, bombard it down since the only ship I have over here is the Hippogriff. I could actually send Centaur and Bunyip over here and just let them get their reinforcements in transit that way. That way they uh, aren't tying up a location that really doesn't isn't going to belong to them. That's Einfeld. Or Enfeld. I went to Hajiroscan and not Vilf. Vilf is over here. So yeah, let's go ahead and have the Bunyip. And Centaur, I do not recall where I left Centaur. So we will just locate Centaur through the outliner. I just need to close out the entries till I get to military fleets. They're currently in Polygar. Okay. So they don't have far to travel. Now we can go ahead and begin terraforming this Savannah world. As you see, a lot of my resources are kind of low, especially alloys and energy credits. I ended up visiting every mercenary company in my borders and uh, upping their size one level. The, uh, the amount of ships they could field. Bastion Devils and Manticore Stormlords are both fully repaired. New species variant available. Now all of my Orintho Rincholans and Swedelands on Era Obis should be Similans. Let's see. Era Obis is down in this vicinity somewhere. Might be down in this area. There it is, in Hazar. So as soon as we finish this ancient refinery, there will already be Similans available to work it. They'll still all be down here working uh, these jobs, I believe. Yeah, there's seven Similans still working the farming jobs. But I should be able to displace a few artisans with Similans. There, all of my artisans are now Similans. And it looks like all my Canadolans got displaced by humans. Which is fine, I can shift some humans off this world. And uh, the Canadolans will move up as I get more artisan slots. Because after I finish the ancient refinery, I'm going to begin shifting agriculture and mining over. Because I had an abundance of food that's way more surplus than I need. I, about 250 is about what I need to stay at. So I, I've started shifting a few of my colonies over in preparation, in preparation for doing arcology projects. Fleet action underway. The Olympus habitat is now complete and ready for colonization. I'm now headed to Tumbleweed to begin the next habitat when I have sufficient amounts. Now, I already had a ship churning out here at Deneb Station. It's got a little over a month, so I'll wait until April to send it out. Because more than likely I wouldn't remember to pop over here March 10th. But we will have the Olympus Habitat, which is a reactor district. So we will start getting even more energy credits. 
Now that fleet action that was underway was a constructor or something that popped up over here. It looks like it got destroyed or fled. I think that debris was already there, so more than likely it fled. The Tauziad Gateway is now in place, the site for it. That's the Ruin Orbital Ring. Go ahead and get started on it. And the Ikinga will just jump out to Motfolino. And as soon as we clear Motfolino, I can give it the orders to head to Hillos. United Latrepians have begun construction of a sensor array. And over here in Hillos, the mega shipyard will be in orbit of the star, so we will just enter orbit of the star. Did they already begin the invasion? Their troop transports disappeared. No. We have about 2,000. We have about half their size here, so we're going to be bombarding for a bit. Battle debris secured. We've gotten the second debris in Wahini Sui, 140 alloys. There's one final debris left over here, and the Sagacious will be returning to Vuzabaru, and I will need to recloak it when it returns. Oh, they're, they're bringing in a single solitary transport ship. Oh! Since I am paying attention to it, we will go ahead and begin the colonization of the Olympus habitat. And this will be Olympus Station. Battle debris secured. In Waltham, we got nearly 800 alloys. That was the only debris here. We have one in Weir and two in Zoblar. Looks like we only have orders to do the first one in Zoblar, so let's just let's start in Zoblar since we now control it. Let's scavenge those, then move to Weir, and then to Keb Duran, and finally to Nathupa. Construction complete. Prazatan Station has finished its construction queue. So what I did here in Harazitan, I think I had a Titan construction yard here, and I just replaced it with a mercenary garrison. Because the fleet that is stationed here, Griffin, has no Titans, so there's no need for a Titan construction yard there. But the mercenary garrison would give them bonuses defending. The sanctions have a very slight impact on my diplomatic weight. I still have 482,000. Just a 20% penalty to my fleet power, which is just a small offset considering Supremacist is giving me 100%. And I had so many other bonuses to economy, the 20% there was barely noticeable as well. So overall, the sanctions are not doing much to me. Uh, apart from lowering my naval capacity to the point where it is impacting my energy credits and alloys from ships. Yeah, right now my cost is increased by about 10%, which may not seem like much, but when you look at the sheer number of fleets I have, that does add up. But my naval capacity should be increasing. Uh, I have a couple of planets concentrating on Farine, uh, concentrating on Furbanites to fill out a lot of the strongholds I had disabled for the longest time. New species variant available. Through hard work and experience, Darshgauda has developed new skills. He got the Roamer boost his survey speed. Mm -hmm. Not really much to survey at this point anymore. Mm -hmm. I 
converted the Orintho Rincholans and Volpolans from three different worlds over to Simolans. Mm -hmm. Those worlds were either in the process of shifting to industry or had four or fewer of that particular district. So I didn't see much point in hanging on to them. You know, like four food districts on a planet that has, say, ten mining districts to shift the food districts over to industry and keep the mining. Our pioneers have made planet fall. We have begun the colonization of Olympus Station. And right now that should be... Right after Unity in the list, I think. Yeah, Hyperion is several rings out. And Jackson is the furthest one. So let's adjust Unity. So we can put Olympus Station right below it. That's still going to take eight months to get it online, but now... It is second in my list. A new world has been secured for our colonists. Bastion Devils paid dividends. They gave us mainly minerals, but a decent chunk of energy credits and food. 5,000 instead of just the two. And Jengala has been colonized. Let me go ahead and begin the terraforming of it. And I will plan it out later. It already has a Cyto Revitalization Center. I probably am going to make this... Yeah, I probably am going to make this a factory world. But what I can do is disable that. Now I have an unemployed hum uh, parahuman. I will redirect. I'll let them re, uh, redirect on their own. And, and if they're still there in July, I will move them to a world that has an open specialist job or ruler job. Let's just go ahead and disable most of these buildings so we're not paying maintenance on them because I do not have anybody working them. I'll keep the hypercons. I'll disable the mineral three mineral districts. Actually, uh, it's probably going to be pure industry here. And let's disable the nano plants and turn one of these chemical plants into a clone vat. And we want to go ahead and move a population over here so we have somebody to decline. So I'll just check on my surplus and come to the first one. Dawnlight has one surplus person who's not going to disrupt a job and Farine, which is something I need to get rid of anyway. So we'll just transfer a Farine from Dawnlight for now. says we have low stability that will be uh, is probably because of the unemployed human but that'll be corrected in a day or two probably now that I have Jengala online I do need to move the sector capital here and we should rename this to Jengala sector now, hopefully that will pick up Schlargos. Which does remind me, yeah, uh, I had deleted the um, sector here in Vilf because it should have been picked up by Genesis over here in Berdios. But yeah, let's let it advance a little bit. Yes, it picked up 
Slargos. And we have completed an orbital ring in the Lithum sector. That would be Hawksworth Station. Or Fincastle Station. Yeah, Fincastle. So we can go ahead and get started on the first habitat module here and our first defense, which will be a hangar bay. And now the factory is on its way to Asher. Today we celebrate the completion of yet another science nexus. If our previous accomplishments hadn't already, this will surely earn us a place on the forefront of scientific progress in the universe. Our technological advancements will allow us to shape the future to our liking. Jengala's dropped 23 stability again. Oh yeah, the other ruler became unemployed. That sucks. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to shuffle some regular humans over here to be colonists and move the parahumans off world. Colonies too new for them to relocate. How long will it take them to demote? Five years? Yeah, we're going to have to do some maintenance with it in July. I had forgotten, yeah, they were going to lose the damn holding that had the merchant to begin with. So I guess what I can do for now is I can reactivate the Galactic Stock Exchange just so they have a damn place to work until I get the ship shelters upgraded and can move one over to be a politician or actually both of them to be politicians and shut the thing down so I can hang on to that stock exchange until I have the politician jobs to move them into that should correct the stability yeah it's 69 percent stability now though the, the icon hasn't gone away there it goes a Clarin interplanetary confederacy is in a commercial pact with the Adnoran mm -hmm. Kingdom. Oh my god! The Soran have joined the Allied Independent Systems. And that puts all of the Soran's subjects into the Allied Independent Systems. United Nations of Earth, Allied Multics, Praku Interstellar Nation, and the Panurian Unity. So the Praku Interstellar Nation is over here, next to the United Nations of Earth. Allied Multics are right here with the Panurian Unity. Well, that is unfortunate because that vetoes my original idea of sweeping through here and destroying them now that the Soran are part of it. But it does mean the next time I go to war with them, I can start trimming out the Allied Multics over this way. And that will also give me the Panorian Union. And once I get to about, uh, get the Allied Multics taken care of, that should give me the range, possibly. Well, that combined with Dacha. No, I still wouldn't be able to jump to the United Nations of Earth at that point. That's unfortunate. But that does mean the next time I go up against them, I can reclaim Seoul and get this area though my focus will still be eliminating the ones over here. I would like to do away with the Glossed Rohanians. Doing away with the Glossed Rohanians will drop two members out. The Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung and the Reshethian State. And then doing away with the Fel Null will drop the 
the United Kresk out. And if I can get the Praku Holy State and a chunk of the Interstellar Picarians, that will help. Though these Reshethian State and the Kresk and the Citizens Alliance of Orc and Fung will probably rejoin by becoming someone else's subject. But I will also have a pretty heavy war against the Allied Multics. Though that does mean now that the people who are coming in toward Marik are no longer doing it in territory I couldn't enter. I can go through and claim this freaking area so that they can't be doing that. But if I can get some of these knocked out in my next war and eliminate some of the threats, the Soran might be a problem though. Let's see if I can find some of their fleets. Well, they, actually, there's their fleets. Yeah, they have quite a bit of fleet power focused here. There's 30 from right there. Another 18 and 17 would be 35 more. That's 65. Uh, another 18 would be uh, seven, uh, 83 and then another 17 would be yeah 1 million fleet power right there and that's not counting the the small amounts there's another just about a hundred scattered out there Let's see United Nations of Earth 16 32. 32 and, and 16 would be 48. Yeah, that's about 70 right there. And another 83 there. Oh, there's a large amount of fleets for the Multics. Most of them are on the smaller size, though. But still, that's a large amount of fleet power there as well. And of course, we still have this huge amount of fleets for the Fel Null here. And there is a large amount of fleet power for the Interstellar Picarians. So yes, I think altogether they would be much stronger than I am. So that would return to being like the first time I got attacked by the Glossed Rohinians and was just basically struggling to stay alive. It all depends on how I end up getting all of my fleets up and running in the next few years. I know it's going to take 10 years before my naval capacity returns. That's really the biggest hit from the sanctions. But yeah, each of my fleets is about 150 or higher. Well, uh, around 150 on average, because some of them are higher and some of them are a little lower. And then, of course, my mercenary companies are significantly higher. Let's see if uh, Fortress Legionnaires, no, they're only at half strength right now, and they're 200k. But the biggest problem is with that many opponents, they're either going to concentrate all their fleets in one huge ball that it's going to be hard for me to get all my fleets into an area to de uh, deal with. Or if they decide to play a little smarter, they will send their fleets in multiple directions, which would force me to break up my fleets so that I couldn't really focus on one group at a time. And if I absorb the Latrepians, I will not have the benefits of a bulwark. Now, the Multics are a Scalarium. Yet they still have a large amount of fleets, even though Scalariums get a penalty to fleets. Yeah, if we look at our contacts, our agreements, if we go to our Scalarium, 
They have a 30% reduction in naval capacity and an increase in the cost and upkeep of ships that goes on up as they gain levels to where it's 50% in every category. So if they have this many fleets at 50% naval capacity, they have a tremendous amount of naval capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, my one hope is that the sudden addition of all of the subjects drive such negative cohesion for the group that members start to flake and maybe it falls apart from within because I would much rather deal with less rather than keep fighting these uphill battles I may turn around and deal with like the Tendra Zun because I don't believe if I were to go to war with them Nobody else is involved other than their subjects. Yeah, so the Tender Zun would be easy to deal with. Let's see about the Veterisians. Uh, they're in a defensive pact with the Star Realms of Shar, so I would have to deal with the Star Realms of Shar and all of their subjects. And then, of course, there's the Hierarchy of Mothith, which is in a different federation. This federation might be easier to tackle. It's the Hierarchy of Mothith, the Kesem Confederacy, Adnoran League, Citizens Confederation, and the Aklaran Interplanetary Confederacy. So the Hierarchy of Mothith is the biggest one I think of that. The Kesem Confederacy got gutted by the Sovereign Jazz Jam. Citizens Confederation of Gavazul is this one. Aklarans are way over here and not really an issue. They're also the subjects of someone. Yeah, the Kesums. So the Kesum would be the one to get rid of to drop out other members, I think. See, Adnoran League is the only one I haven't checked. There's so many Adnorans. There's the Adnoran Imperium, the Adnoran Kingdom. Where's the Adnoran League? What the hell? United Latrepian Domains all the way over here? How did they get that? We've never been at war with the Star Realms of Shar. Alright, where is this other Adnoran? Because I can see the Imperium. And this is the Kingdoms. There's the Adnoran League. It's a tiny one in between, in the middle of the Kingdoms. Yeah, it, it rebelled. That's right. All right, it's a member of the Pan-Galactic Pact, not a uh, subject of anyone. But the Hierarchy of Moffith would probably be the biggest threat here. And it also would allow me to surround Dacha and cut out a lot of the gateways that they had been using to attack my flanks. It may be that I just try and hold my own and hit some of the smaller empires, maybe absorbing uh, the Tender Sun and a few of my subjects until a crisis hits and hope that a crisis guts one of these federations. Looks like I got two more of my fleets popped up. Well, that electric eel is supposed to be part of Scylla. For some reason, it didn't travel to them. 
And that's a more. These two are Scylla reinforcements that for some reason did not join up with Scylla. And there's another one. Where is Strike Force? Scylla is at full strength. Oh crap. It has a ship in it that is not supposed to be there. Alright, so Scylla. I need to separate out the Cyclops class. So that Scylla can absorb its reinforcements. So that electric eel, the moray, there, now Scylla should be at full, full strength, yes, okay. This strike force for, is supposed to be strike force Cyclops. And Strike Force Cyclops is supposed to be out of Hillos, I believe. Yes. And it is going to be an all battleship fleet with just 25 Cyclops. Now, as soon as I can locate, there's Hillos. Now, the Cyclops is a battleship that stays at artillery range. It has a tachyon lance for its heavy hitter, no minimum range for it, and it uses kinetic artillery, and if things get under the minimum range, that's what the Stormfire autocannons are for. And it just has a mix of shield hardener, reactive armor, and regenerative hull tissue. I just want to see how well this battleship performs. It will continue using its tachyon lance no matter how close enemies get but it may lose the kinetic artillery for the storm fire. Now the tachyon lance melts armor and hull, and these are anti-shield. One thing I'm a little disappointed about is the limitations with now with autocannons being available for every slot, I'm a little disappointed that battleships cannot be brawlers computer-wise. Yeah, why can't I give it a picket computer where it will come into close range and have higher tracking and be heavy on the autocannons? Why can't I give it a short range combat computer and allow the battleship to wade in there and do punishment when all of its weapons can be short range? I'm also a little disappointed that the Titan does not have more options where it is only large weapons. Why can't I give a Titan a mix of medium and smalls, just like I can battleships? Since missiles are now medium and small weapons, I could load them up with missiles that would have close to the range that the Titan weapon has. Why can't I make a Titan brawler that loads up with autocannons in these large slots and chooses to close range? Why are the only options artillery and carrier? Why does it not have picket or other options? I just don't understand some of the limitations they have hung on to after changing the weapons. Back when missiles needed a specific slot, it was understandable that you wouldn't need other slots for larger ships because, I mean, why would you want to put small weapons on a big ship? Well, I would. I'd love to load up a battleship with nothing but small short-range autocannons and tell it to wait in there and do picket, where it's intercepting other ships, absorbing the damage, and shooting at smaller craft. But yeah, there, there needs to be more options or less restriction on what you can put the computers in. I mean, why can't I set a Titan to be a short-range craft? Or just do strafing, you know, get in there and in the middle of combat and get in people's faces. I would absolutely love a swarm computer on a large ship so it will come up to point blank range and get in people's faces 
and unload with a sheer number of guns, especially now that auto cannons can be in any ship slot. Battle debris secured. We finished the last debris in Rohini Sui for mm -hmm. about 750 alloys. As soon as we leave the system, I can recloak. I do need to go back to the Cyclops fleet and send it to its home base in Hilo Station so it's not sitting here at Chadib. And we do still have quite a few reinforcements en route. Praku Holy State is in a research agreement with the Praku Interstellar Nation. United Kresh Commonality is in a commercial pact with the Praku Interstellar Nation. Nation of Selnok Prime is in a non-aggression pact with the Oxferin Collective. With the Afoxerin Collective. Construction complete. We have concluded the gateway in the Sosta system, so it is now connected to my network. Fairmathrias station has completed its shift over to an anchorage. Yeah, it's pretty much set until I get a ha uh, habitat in here, and I would switch the resource silos over to a black site. And Aphelion Station has finished its construction. Of course, I am now getting ready to shift this away from being a shipyard. It's not currently building anything. Because I believe this is in... Oh, yeah, this is in Kel Nudar. Um, there is a... mercenary company here so I'm going to shift this away from being a shipyard that's what I just did is I just replaced a Titan construction I think with a mercenary garrison but yeah let's go ahead and dismantle the shipyard so it doesn't build anything here Rhea has become my third colony to fully switch over to the new slave species. It has its full allotment of Simolans, a Furbanite, and then the humans up there. Down here we do have a couple of Philodolans. I actually originally had three because I had a leisure district. But as you see, I shifted the leisure district over to trade because with just clerks I'm able to keep the 20% citizen pop happiness. So there was no need to hang on to the leisure district. I could switch it over to a trade district, which wasn't costing me consumer goods, and still provided amenities and now trade value instead of a little bit of unity. And as you see, I'm shifting buildings around. I actually went through most of my colonies, and I am shifting buildings around purely based on aesthetics. I'm basically trying to get the ancient refinery into the first slot. Okay, so I'm replacing the exotic gas refinery with a chemical plant. Then I'm going to replace the synthetic crystal plants with a exotic gas refinery. And then I'm going to delete the chemical plant, which should shift all these buildings one to the left, and then I can build the synthetic crystal plant again. So that's what I was doing. That way I didn't have to destroy and rebuild this, which cost a significant amount of minor artifacts. I just have to rebuild this, it costs minerals, which isn't that big of a deal for me. I've been selling surplus minerals. Even only earning about 4K a month, I'm generating plenty of minerals. It's alloys and energy credits that need to increase. But yeah, a lot of my colonies I had gone through and I didn't like the order buildings were in at some point I will probably shift this ministry of production over so that all of my research complexes are side by side just 
replace this with a research complex. When I get it upgraded, replace this with a ministry. As a matter of fact, I can go ahead and start on that. But yeah, I'm, it's a waste of minerals and all just for a little bit that had been annoying me. I mean, I'd been controlling my OCD in that regard for some time, but after a while, just looking at the haphazard display of buildings when I like them all in the nice, neat rows, I just guess I just reached my limit and <laughs> decided, well, I've got the economy to handle this. Let's fix some of these colonies so they don't look so ugly. I need to shift some more Samolans over. In Hinckley's hope, we are going to be shifting away the Orintho Rincholans and Volpolans, I believe it is. Yes. I think there's only one of each. Yeah, it's just a total of two pops. But Hinckley's hope is doing away with having food and reactor di or generator districts. And I attempted to build, now that I had a free megastructure slot, I attempted to build the mega shipyard here, but it will not allow me to do it. If I right click on this and choose build mega structure, it's now grayed out, it says cannot build due to existing mega structures. So these ruined orbital rings take up a system's mega structure count. So I'm going to have to repair this orbital ring before I can start on the mega shipyard. And to do that, I need influence, which is annoying. Yeah, I, I know I rant quite a bit about how much they uh, require influence for, but I really think they have way too many influence sinks in this game. Great here in hierarchy is in a defensive New species pack variant available. with the star realms of Shar. And that conversion just flipped over. I'm going to go ahead and choose Furbanites and see if I have any young Furbanites that need to be shifted over. I have three. And that will be done August 2nd. Nation of Selnok Prime is in a non-aggression pact with the Great Heron Hierarchy. Kravadox League is in a research agreement with Miravandian Enterprises. And United Kresk are in a research agreement with the Praku Interstellar Nation. New species variant available. Our Furbanites are shifted over. The Great Heron Hierarchy is in a non-aggression pact with the Gudgan. And we have completed an orbital ring in the Ofang system. So Melpomenia now has its orbital ring. So we can get started on a hangar bay and our first habitation module. Spaceport reports enemy contact. We have bathed Weir Prime and are now on our way to Nathupa. Spaceport reports enemy contact. What spaceport? The space amoeba haven't moved in over here. I'm not seeing any spaceport with red, so my guess is that maybe a fleet had tried to pop up either in uh, Waltham, Zoblar, or Weir. I don't see any additional debris that has popped up. Interstellar, debris secured. Interstellar Picarian Coalition is in a commercial pact with Praku Interstellar Nation. We got our first debris in Zoblar, nearly 800. And I can now recloak the Sagacious. So all of my science vessels should be recloaked. Blocker cleared. That leaves one of the messed up 
terraforming residue on that world we terraformed. Now, I did notice it it got rid of several generator districts. Yeah, we have one blocker remaining here on Smithius, and it has freed up a generator district that we can rebuild. But it had blocked out three of the generator districts I already had built here and ended up with them as servants and I'm having to rebuild it. Now this would be a prime candidate for an Ecumenopolis later on though I have enough already queued up because I mean its biggest is generator districts with only five but I am gonna kind of hold off on this one until I get some others done and see if I can't get the Volpolans and Swedelands finished here so that they can all convert over to Samolans. We have made very little progress in bombarding this planet. Felnol Cooperative are in a commercial pact with the Praku Interstellar Nation. Even more fleets are converging on their capital. Hopefully we will get rid of the crime in Construction complete. St. Hossick before we're ready to invade. Our trade route in Dawkins system is poorly protected and passes through what has largely become lawless space. An increasing number of pirate smugglers and very other criminal elements have been drawn to the system and they now raid our shipping with near impunity. Kappa Privateers gave us 10,000 energy credits as dividends. Dawkin? What trade route do I have that goes through Dawkin? I don't have a trade route going through Dawkin. Somebody else has a trade route going through Dawkin and I'm reaping the penalties of it. Because all of my trade routes are 100%. There's no piracy. Well, we have an idle fleet over here. Let's just send Manticore Stormlords to deal with these idiots. And it's interesting that the Manticore Stormlords are right next to where I decided to base Strike Force Manticore. They keep trying to come into Lindula. Beauclair's Legacy Station has finished its construction queue. It just got its last habitation module for now. Uh, it wasn't a huge priority. It had plenty of district slots available, but I decided to go ahead and switch it over while I could. I've been analyzing my options proceeding forward here. Now the problem is if I hit either of the federations and weaken them slightly, there are a handful of independents that they will just snag up and strengthen back up. Now most of the independents are at places I can't quite reach, like the Great Here in Hierarchy way over here or the Gudgen Commonwealth and yeah they're still independent and there's a few others a Kano organism a Foxaren collective nation of Selnok Prime so there most of the most of these are small and not a threat there are three big clusters of independents left that I need to take out. The Star Realm of Shar is still independent. Is and they have the Sovereignty of Tuxcali, United Anthurian State, Sovereign Jazzitan Assembly, Dar Forge, and the Adnorn Kingdom as subjects. So they're fairly strong in and of themselves, plus they are the number three okay. empire, I believe. I've actually dropped down. Okay, they're the number four empire. They're close to the number three. 
I dropped down because since the Soran have joined a federation, they got 61,000 in score to jump above me. So I am going to have to deal with that federation before the end game. But in the interim, what I need to do is like hit the Star Realms of Shar before they join one of the two federations. Now the Star Realms of Shar are in defensive packs with the Federesians and the Great Heron Hierarchy. If I attack them directly, the Great Heron Hierarchy will join in, not a threat, and I would be at war with the Federesians anyway. And more than likely I would be at war with all of their subjects. Let's check that. No. Uh, the Sovereign Jazz Jan Assembly and the Ethereum League do not participate in their wars. So, attacking the Veterician League, I would not be at war with the Great Heron Hierarchy, but it would bring in the Star Realm of Shar and the subjects they have that join their wars. However, the Veterician League has begun constructing a Dyson Sphere. Now, it takes an Ascension perk to complete a Dyson Sphere. So if I take over the Veterician League space before they complete this, I will never be able to complete it. However, I could subjugate them. I could declare a war to make them a vassal or a tributary. And I don't even need to completely occupy their territory to do it. I could just rip off a small section as a tributary. So, I wouldn't be able to go total war, but it would put me also at war with the Star Realm of Shar and a few of their allies, and I would need, if I wasn't doing total war, I would need claims to gain territory, and I would love to gain territory with the sovereignty of Tuxcali over here. Especially since the Star Realms of Shar are regularly at war with the Hisman Protectors. Right now they'll be at peace for another two years. And probably within five years of that peace ending, Hisman Protectors will jump on them again. Which means that would be the prime time to attack the Veterician League and subjugate them. And if I just occupied part of their space and ripped off a new subject, that new subject would have their relations with me reset because they would be a brand new empire. Now the question remains, if I take over this territory, does that new subject get the Ascension to perk to complete the Dyson Sphere? I'm not, I'm unsure. But the other uh, uh, independent is the Tender Zun. The Tender Zun are not in any sort of defensive packs. And they just have the Verzak and the Next Nexus. They're extremely weak. The, there are two issues with me declaring war on the Tender Zun. First, they are also working on a Dyson Sphere. I want them to complete it before I declare war. And secondly, they have a lot of holdings in my territory, which means I would lose those holdings when I destroy them, and that would mean I would end up with a lot of unemployment on several of my worlds where they have branch offices. However, losing the clerk jobs is not a big deal. Most of my people working clerk jobs are domestic servants. They would just end up being servants and not become unemployed. The problem is the merchants. Because merchants are ruler class jobs. And that would give me an unemployed ruler class human. The merchant actually is a job I should probably close out on both of my worlds just in preparation to declare war on the Tender Zun eventually and so that they can become uh, start moving to other worlds that need the jobs because merchants provide trade value and amenities. Now they provide 12 trade value which converts directly to 12 energy credits. If I were to look at one of my technicians, a technician 
provides 20 energy credits. A technician is a worker class job that would have lower upkeep, lower political power, and lower housing needs and amenity usage than a ruler class job and provides more benefit. The main benefit to trade value is if you are being diplomatic in a game. Because the more trade value you have, the more appealing it is to have things like commercial packs with you. Which means you can get more diplomatic agreements going, keep reputation up and all of that. I'm not doing diplomatic. I don't care about trade value. Overall, my trade value, I think it's around uh, 1,200. I just reloaded the game because I had saved after doing my maintenance. Uh, no, it's, it's around 6,000. That's right, because uh, I was positive 4,000 before I saved the game. So it's around 6,000 that I'm getting from trade, but only a small portion of that is coming from merchants. I have 128 colonies, assuming I have a merchant on each one. Each merchant is providing 12. That's 1,500 trade value about I'm getting from merchants. So I could close out all of these and still be positive on energy credits. I'm getting enough in trade value from my clerks and other things and honestly on some of these worlds I'm getting more benefit from the amenities provided for servants than the amenities provided for clerks and the trade value is inconsequential so I've closed out clerk jobs so that I'm getting the full plus 20% happiness from amenities by having servants over clerks. Now they have reworked some of the trade value and amenity deals. I think clerks provide more amenities and less trade value in the current iteration of the game. They added a specialist called the trader that gives trade value and amenities. They cut down on a lot of the ruler class jobs. So the main benefit that the merchant gives me is being a ruler class job and giving me more stability for having a human here who is extremely happy and has a lot of political power, significantly more than slaves. But my specialists provide plenty of happiness. Their political power is about a fifth of what a ruler class is, but their happiness is close. So they don't counteract quite as many slaves as a ruler does but I can start shutting down these science uh, these merchant jobs as a matter of fact I can go ahead and start shutting down ones that don't currently have anybody in it in preparation for losing the jobs there now uh, that will impact my overall trade value I was at like plus four thousand four hundred uh, we'll see what it updates to when I advance later. And I will have to edit my files and remove the humans needed over there. And I can slowly start shifting humans out of existing merchant jobs, just closing them down and moving the humans elsewhere where they would be more benefit. And what I'm going to do in the interim, though, is I'm probably just going to absorb my existing vassals. By absorb, I mean release them as subjects, declare war on them, and conquer their territory. Because that costs no influence to do. <laughs> After the Palpatine has swept Nathupa and Breslin, I will bring it back up here and take the archives. And then I believe I am going to get Citadel and United Mirvandium Imperium. Right now, I believe they still have positive loyalty with me. But I'm not really getting a huge benefit from them. Here, I'm getting a handful of alloys and about 175 consumer goods. I'm already positive 200. I'm also getting about 850 energy credits and the other two are inconsequential they won't make a huge impact here 
Strategic resource wise, they're giving me three moats and six gases. I have reorganized my empire to where I'm getting about 30 surplus moats and 75 surplus gases and crystals. So that's going to be a drop in the bucket. Now, the agreement we have is giving me a further 15%. I don't think that's going to be as significant an impact either. Now, 15% is off of the base, and I have other things giving me bonuses, such as a 40% for the ancient refinery. So even if we took this as 15% of 400, that would end up being 60. And that would actually drop me like negative 30, but I don't think it's that high. I think it's significantly lower. I think it's more like 15% of 300, which would end up being 45. I may go a little bit negative, but I can compensate because I'm still not working all of my jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, the other benefit of having a Scalarium and a Prospectorium is the planetary build speed and building cost redu reduction I get for having a overworld overlord relay network connection so i will be losing that but for the most part they're not doing well enough with their territory to make it worth leaving and if we look at the research institute their agreement was giving me 40 percent research station output and one additional choice alternative and let's see their overlord thing is a 10 percent bonus to research output so i will take a hit in my research uh i wonder if that affects the science nexus the 10 percent from agreements yes i'm getting that from agreements because this is a station so i'm only getting 10 percent from the output so yeah, I'll be losing 30 from each of these. So I will be taking a science hit by losing my Scalarium. But I can handle that. I'd much rather just take the territory so I don't have to worry about it and whittle down my vassals so I can eventually get rid of feudal society for another civic that is going to be of more value for me. I currently have enough to reform my government when I whittle down to one. So after I get these two, I will head down here and take Pankisha and Bags Holdings. And I might need to lay claims here since it borders Latrepia. Lay a claim on this one. After I get it, I shouldn't need a claim on that one. And then we can move down here and absorb the Brienne and Stellar Nation and the Osiris colonies and that will leave me with just the Latrepians and at their current loyalty level I can keep them for about 20 years before they dip below zero in loyalty so I could hang on to them they are useful as a distraction in wars being a bulwark, anybody who comes over here trying to take their territory suffers damage. And they can go places I cannot. So they've been able to carry the fight like to Dacha just by traveling there. Uh, if we end up at war with the Star Realms of Shar, they most likely can get to areas I cannot because somehow they ended up claiming that territory. And they would be able to do strikes and basically serve as a, another herring force that they have to divert fleets to deal with. And then at the end of 20 years, I will most likely end up absorbing them because by then I should be stronger. Right now my overall fleet strength is 2.6 million. Uh, I have new fleets I did not even include. They are very small numbers right now, like Strike Force Bukovac is only a 3K. I didn't bother including it. When it gets up to full strength, it should be around 160 or 150. 
Same thing with Strike Force Behemoth. And a lot of my mercenary companies are not at full strength. So they're not providing quite as much as they should. Let's see, the Fortress Legionnaires, still not at full strength. They're still almost a 200k fleet. So within 10 to 20 years, when all of these fleets build up a little bit more, my fleet power should be fairly significant. Now, I will probably still take the opportunity, if I have completed my other objectives by then, to see about subjugating at least a portion of the Veterician League the next time the Kisman Protectors, or Hisman Protectors, declare war against the Star Realms of Shar, I'll probably wait a couple of months till people are committed where they're sending their fleets, and then jump in. And after we are able to secure the Veterisians, now I will lay a claim on Trappist if I don't already have one. I do have a one, I have a claim on it already. So I could take over Trappist and obliterate the Holy Sidoran League, or I could declare the Filthy, Secret Filthy War, because I believe they are, yeah, they have pledged Secret Filthy to us, but their attitude toward us is already hostile. I don't want them as a subject to the way they are. I would rather wipe them out and start over. But yeah, we could rip off a section as a new subject because it would start with free, with new uh, relations. Rip off a subject here and make some claims over here and do some damage to the his uh, sovereignty of Tuxcali. And after we have secured the Veterisians, it will be at peace for 10 years, but the next time I go to war against the Star Realms of Shar, I could do total war and start taking territory. Of course, by then, hopefully, the Tender Zun will have completed their Dyson Sphere, and I can go after them and eliminate this section over here. We'll just have to see how it goes. Now, while I was doing that, one thing I did notice about the Osiris colonies is it answered a question I had earlier. They have converted their capital to an ecumenopolis. So I had the Arcology project when I created them, so they had that as well. They are performing a mastery of nature on a world that is already an ecumenopolis. That answered that question as to whether or not you could do mastery of nature on an ecumenopolis. You can. I no longer have to perform Mastery of Nature before beginning the Ecumenopolis project. That's something I can push back until after it becomes an Ecumenopolis to give it a couple extra districts. Station reports enemy contact. Who's attacking Smithia Station? Oh, the pirates. <laughs> I've forgotten about them. I spent so long doing maintenance. Well, we've already blown up one of them. This is my orbital ring around Smithius. Let's see how well the defense platforms... Oh, well, my lord. I just noticed the military power of my orbital ring compared to my outpost. Yeah, they have double the strength of my outpost. They have less than 10% the strength of my orbital ring. I don't even think I need my fleet to head this way. Oh, pirates are gone. So, Manticore Stormlords, just go home. There's no reason to sweep down here. They never got through our shields. They had medium mass drivers, and we obliterated all 14 of their ships. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, is a debris gonna pop up here in a day or two? Apparently not. Mm -hmm. Now I have enough influence, I was banking for this, to go ahead and begin 
repairing the ruined orbital ring here in Hillos. It'll take just under a year and a half. Yeah, it's that one on the list. Afterwards, I should be eligible, when this completes, I should be eligible to begin the megastructure here. Yeah, we can only upgrade two megastructures at a time. So, ruined orbital rings. While an orbital ring does not count against a megastructure in a territory, the ruined versions do. Now, perhaps that was a bug, and they've already addressed it in the current version. I do not know. We're two months away from making it to Nathupa. So we'll begin charging up in January. So by April, we should be done with Nathupa and moving on to Breslin. Battle debris secured. We've gotten the uh, debris in Zoblar for nothing. That was a troop transport. We're now on our way to Weir. And there are just three debris, four debris left. We have claimed a new world. Olympus Station should be now online. I can begin with my clone vats so that I can start generating actually I got an unemployed human here perhaps I should start with something he can work I can have a reactor district online in two months that will at least give him a place to work well more than likely yeah never mind Next month, if he's still here and hasn't migrated on his own, I will shift him to another world. This is going to be a habitat starting out for the amenities and stability boost. And we do need to shift a slave over here so that we have something we can start declining next month. I know I've got a few that are uh, just have like one domestic servant left to get rid of. Yeah, right here, Smithius. I can remove Smithius from the list and take a Super Brugen from there. So we do have something we can start declining when the month kicks over if that unemployed human is there. Actually, I could go ahead and relocate that unemployed human now to Camelot. Because Camelot is the world where I have currently been sending my humans. And he should become a bureaucrat. Yep. Now another thing I had to discover doing my maintenance, since I had a couple of places where I was declining species that I had multiples of, I did find out if you have two different species to alternate between like Farine and Praku that I have large amounts of, the minute the first Farine or whatever is declined, if I immediately switch to the Praku, rather than staying on the Farine, if I just keep alternating between the two, it does not unemploy everybody and create a disruption in my empire. So I have started whittling down some of the large counts, like the Habenti and stuff, because I can decline a Habenti after that Habenti is declined, decline something else, and then once that's declined, go back to the Habenti and slowly whittle them down. Sorry, I was in shock from the first pop-up. In a final act of abandoning their organic roots, the citizens of the Star Realm of Shar have uploaded their neural patterns into synthetic avatars. The new machine species calls itself the Biotronics, and its members are impervious to disease or aging. Just how complete the neural upload process was remains to be seen. United Nations of Earth has pledged secret fealty to us.
I just cannot begin to comprehend this. First off, they're hostile. But they know we are strong. They are a bulwark under the Soran. Yeah, we have absolutely terrible relations. We're at the ne uh, maximum negative opinion, possibly. Yeah, negative 1500 is as low as it goes relation-wise. Of course, part of the problem is we're currently in breach of galactic law, rivals with allies, but I mean, they don't like the way I conduct warfare. And the fact that I have slaves. Not to mention the fact they've got a robot in control of their empire. And in this particular playthrough, I am very anti-machine. Because of events that happened earlier in the game. So this is... Yeah, I have no idea why an empire that embraced cybernetics has a robot in charge of it and is e egalitarian xenophiles would pledge secret fealty to me when I have shown I am completely anti-cyborg and machine and I am an authoritarian and a xenophobe. It just boggles the mind that the United Nations of Earth would... They must be that afraid of me. They're just like, don't kill us. That gives me another option should a war pop up with the Soran that I could rip the United Nations of Earth away from them. Now the question is, if I do a secret fealty war with them, do the United Nations of Earth join my side immediately? In which case they would cease to be a bulwark and they would immediately send their ships that way. That could be useful. But that implies the Soran and I be the ones to go to war. I can't declare war on the Mirvandians and pull the Glossbrahenians in and pursue a secret fealty. But that that is interesting. Now, we should be getting a pop-up soon. There it is, from the Star Realm of Shar. Attention, denizens of the galaxy. The rumors you've heard are true. We have abandoned the flawed organic containers that imprisoned our mind and embraced the future. With minimal data loss, all of our citizens have uploaded their neural patterns into new synthetic avatars. These superior platforms will serve us much better than the flesh constructs we have abandoned. Do not be alarmed by our new appearance. Although we may be stronger, faster, more intelligent, and immune to aging, rest assured that we are still the same beings as we were before. Well, the biggest difference is now I even want to kill you more. You know, they've got about 2.6 million fleet power. I mean, no, 4.6 million fleet power between all of the fleets they have running around here. You know, I haven't even actually talked to them. We'd be delighted to trade with you humans. There are some resources unique to our cluster that might be of interest to you. What would you like to know? Why are there signs of battle in the cluster? Oh, are you referring to the Shattered Planets? They were the result of several regrettable mining accidents that occurred long ago. When we found ourselves stranded within our cluster, we had to make do with whatever minerals were available in the systems we could reach. Unfortunately, during the darkest centuries of isolation, some of our people were, were a bit too eager in their attempts to secure resources. Mistakes were made. The pause between regrettable and mining tells me that's a lie. Your ships are of a peculiar design. They are products of countless millennia of design iterations. We had a lot of time on our hands after all. Sadly, non-Disanu observers are not permitted on board our ships. 
They were specifically designed with the unique Dusanu physiology in mind, and any visitors would only disrupt the work of their highly trained crews. Why is the Widra system off limits? For reasons of national security, that is all we can say for now. The Widra system will remain restricted and off limits to all non Dasanu life forms indefinitely. Please refrain from entering it. Are you certain the L gates weren't made by nanites? Quite. Please, this is not a topic we wish to discuss. Did you have any other questions? Nanites seem to be a sensitive topic. Why? We will tell you one last time. Do not inquire further into this matter. This friendship of our two empires depends on it. Why do they not want to speak about nanites? My guess is that they are s nanites. They are the nanites. Very well. We will respect your wishes for now. Let's discuss other matters. Anytime I want, I can push this, but... That's the extent of the dialogue with them. I didn't see an option of for trading for anything. Now, the L cluster is usually a source of nanites, motherships, and interdiders. Oh, I can look at their ship details now. Nanite fighters. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah that about right there tells me you guys are nanites. Completely penetrate shields and two thirds of armor. If I do go to war with these people, I need to switch my policy back to technology and see if I can get my hands on anything. So the mothership is a carrier. All of these ships are carriers. Now, I am heavy on point defense, so that shouldn't be too awfully bad. Their energy spheres are designed for anti-armor, not shield. So my fleets that have unbypassable shields would do fairly well against them. They only have level 1 hyperdrives. My lord, you guys are out of date. But yes, I believe I could um, handle them a lot better than I was expecting since their primary source of damage is nanites, fighters, and I am heavy on point defense, I would probably obliterate these things. Their average damage is 27 and a half. My average damage is 40 for my strike craft. Average damage on that is pretty high though. It's got a pretty good fire rate too. Oh, it's a missile. Yeah, those are missiles in a torpedo slot. So those are an upgraded form of neutron launcher. Let's see, they do 86.2 damage. What does my neutron launcher do? Oh, the huge difference in rate of fire here. This thing is slow as shit. It does three. And I get a ten with my torpedoes. So that is a very impressive missile. And that goes back to the old design of before they switch missiles to be small and medium and they use the G slots. Uh, those would be torpedoes now, but missiles and strike craft are there. One source of damage, and my ships are heavy on point defense. I actually think I could do a lot better against them than I was expecting. But I have other concerns over here for now. I have quite a list of colonies that have merchants on them to relocate. I've relocated quite a few because some of my newer colonies had available politician slots and as capitals upgrade more politician slots will become available but it's going to be a long and slow process as I get more colonies I'll have more locations to send them and it's just something that's going to take some time new species variant available I converted uh, a 
few more Orintho Rincholans and Volpolans over to Simolans. There's only a handful, but it is areas that I'm doing away with more small amounts of farming and generators. The bombardment here is still going fairly slow. Construction complete. Antok Rom has upgraded. I was waiting for the upgrade before I continued doing more here. And go ahead and start on another shipyard for now. Our pledge of loyalty from the Latrepians has timed out. I think we need to renew that. Yes, because otherwise they won't last 10 years before they're negative. We only need 20 years. And I have an abundance of consumer goods. You have any interest in them? None. Okay. Moats I'm low on. Exotic gases I have quite a few. We'll go ahead and give them a thousand, give them a little bit more positive to trade deal. We restored order on Magal and got rid of the criminal underworld there. Now I can start converting the enforcer job back to a mineral extraction or mineral purification plant. That still leaves St. Hossack. I acquired all of those about the same time. Hopefully it will clear up soon. Oh, and I forgot to adjust the population because we will have gotten these criminals will be freed up. There we go. Now they're all working as miners. Science Division reports a new breakthrough. Latrepians agreed to renew their Pledge of Loyalty. Focusing Arrays. Perfecting the firing cadence of laser weaponry is a task that could keep the engineering elite of any given planet busy for centuries. We'll work on Shield Harmonics 2 next, get more shield hit points. Oh, they're finally building hyper relays through their systems for me. Kappa Privateers is fully repaired. The Trepians have quite a force of fleets at this point. Sovereign Jazzajan Assembly broke their secret fealty to us. Delta Corsairs have paid their dividends. 2,000 of every research and energy credits. I need to bank my influence for the next few cycles because I have some sleeper cells that are ready to be renewed. The Fel Null, the uh, Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung, I think, and the Glossed Rohenians. I might be mistaken on the Citizens Alliance. It might be a different one. I can check real quick. So the Fel Null becomes available in July. The Veterisians are available in October. And then Orkham Fung, the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung, is in January. So it was the Gloss Rohanians I was mistaken on. And then I have until 2468 before I have to worry about any more. Now it takes 50 influence to start on a orbital ring and I do have 
an idle constructor ship, that's fine. It, it'll be delayed for nine months starting on it. But I get this influence back in one cycle. So, and it takes about a year, almost a year and a half to build an orbital ring. So keeping my them tied up, I will still slowly climb an influence. The reason it has stayed so low is I'm spinning it on other things such as habitation modules in existing ones and on upgrades to my habitats. And I have decided it'll be a while before I get the slot. I'll have to wait till I finish the strategic coordination center in about four and a half years. But I have decided to put a quantum catapult here in Zipper over the Pulsar. So I will be starting that next. After I finish this orbital ring and start the mega shipyard, I would be able to shift this constructor down here and wait until the strategic coordination center is completed so that I can start the quantum catapult. New species variant available. I shifted over... I think it was Jurg Onderin. I shifted over the uh, Volpolens because I'm done with the energy mm -hmm. districts there and I'm going to start shifting it to industry. It had about six Volpolens there filling up all of the current industrial slots. Well, we've got them down about 600 from the last time I checked. Felnol built Battle a gateway in the DM system. I was expecting that. So they now have a way to get their massive amounts of fleets that are still parked here out. We got nearly 200 alloys mm -hmm. in Weir. We're now on our way to Keb Duran. And then finally to Nathupa. Construction complete. Leffingwell Station has upgraded. Now I can go ahead and get started on something here. Rather than starting on a habitation module, Leffingwell, sta uh, Leffingwell is a foundry. So let's get started on alloy processing facilities to boost our alloy output. That takes a year, so that'll keep Leffingwell Station tied up for a while. We have swept Bre uh, Nathupa, Nathupa Prime and are now on our way to get Breslin. Afterwards, I will be able to get in position to absorb Jalora. I have fleets in the vicinity. Strike Force Medusa would probably be able to handle this entirely by itself. Yes. 38K station with a 1.5K orbital ring, so let's say 40k, and then another 40k in fleets, another 15k in fleets, they got about 100k, and I'm 161, so I should be able to take Jalora entirely by myself with Strike Force Medusa. But if necessary, I could bring Hydra over as well. Or better yet, I could use the Fortress Legionnaires. Because I don't have to replace their ships. They do. And they're nearby. So we'll just use the Fortress Legionnaires to clear out Jalora. And then send the Palpatine to bathe it. They tried launching some more transports. 
the Thupa station will probably take them out. Yep, they're already disappeared. Construction complete. Destinicon station has completed its habitation module. It's in the process of shifting these clone vats to research labs, so I don't necessarily need to queue up a new administration, administrative arcology just yet. They've still only got one transport over here. Blocker cleared. Our terraforming specialists have now cleared the final terraforming residue on Smithius. The cleanup was quite painful and sticky. It was not all for naught. Anal analysis of the cause of this issue and the fallout has led to further our understanding of terror allergy. Well, this is the fourth time this has happened, and you still haven't learned from your mistakes, so don't give me that crap. Knock six months off of the mega art installation. There's a delay updating the UI that I had become familiar with. Basically, it takes one more change to the colony to update like your amenities and your crime and your stability so you can see what moving a particular person has done. And when I was trying to decide how many servants to kick out of jobs here, I only had the one job to toggle. So, you see it hasn't changed at all. But if I close out this one empty job, it is now ad uh, adjusted. And it says that I have 13.6. Well, I have just closed out one and dropped one to a servant, and it's still showing 13.6. So when I drop the next one, this display is actually for having one more. So as I was going through here, I would keep closing jobs till I got to 20% and then back up one. But I found a better way to do it, which is, say I close out this job, this is showing the previous one, if I just click favorite, it updates. So then I can close out the next one, you see it hasn't changed, unclick favorite, it updates. So now I can see more specifically, yeah, I had to, I had to close out all the jobs to get up to the full 20% here. But yeah, you don't have to toggle a job or move some other worker to get it to update. You can just toggle favorite on something. Uh, preferably something where all the jobs are full so it won't pull people from other areas and mess up your counts. But you could like favorite the job you're closing out to get that update. Now in August, I have to adjust several colonies to see if I can get the merchants out. I am building ministries. New species variant available. Or they are upgrading capitals. The gateway in Algarab is now in place. So we can go ahead and begin the upgrade of it. And get rid of this constructor that was just there to get the gateway online. I converted a couple of young Furbanites over. Let's have a quick check on the font of knowledge. It's getting there. They still only have the one transport of their own here. At Norm Imperium is no longer a valid rival for our empire. So next month we'll need to pick a new rival. And the envoy cost was affected by the sanctions. 
all, all together, it's only costing me 0.25 more influence for the two agreements I have, so it's not a big deal. Griffin Services paid us a small amount of energy credits, food, and minerals. Now I need to select a new rival. Allied Maltics have chosen to rival us. We will... Oh, and they've got a robot in charge, too. We will rival them. Now, it's around August 28th when the build is going to happen. At Norm Imperium, close their borders to us. Three colonies. Jurg Woodall, Broadleaf, and Neritum. And I think I have your Woodall hotkey. So yeah, it'll be done with its Ministry of Production. When it gets down to one Construction day, complete. I need to do some mm -hmm. modifications on them. Dawnlight has finished its habitation module. Battle debris secured. We got the debris in Kebduran for nothing. Just to be on the safe side, I gave myself an extra day. So here in Yurgwoodall, we are about to build a Ministry of Production, which is going to add a politician job. Now, I have moved all of the humans specialists, with the exception of the medical workers who are favorited and will not shift upwards, off to other worlds. So now we can close out this merchant job. I also have to visit Broadleaf, which is... in Hajiroscant. Also, Broadleaf and Port Bixby eliminated the last few robots in my empire. Uh, I have no robots that are being destroyed anymore. They've all been eliminated. So we're about to get a Ministry of Production here. I will close out this merchant. So it should take that one. Yeah, the only human still here other than that is a medical worker that is favorited. And Naritum, which was in Ulus. I just have the two medical workers here. It's about to upgrade capitals, so I'm going to move two uh, merchants from other places here. So I closed out the ones in St. Natchbull and Camelot. Now if we watch your Woodall, this unemployed human should become the next politician. There we go. He filled in the slot. Let me double check the other locations. The ship shelter ceased being upgraded. Huh. Somehow I had lost a population. That's what it was. I had shifted a human off of here who was a colonist. Let's see. Now, these guys won't move off because the colony is too new, so I can leave them here, and they should fill in those slots. This will be built before that human is grown, so should not create an issue for them to leave. And over at Broadleaf, it did pull up the favorited medical worker. That's unfortunate. So I guess we will open up this merchant sh slot again, and we'll just have to shift that one at another time. Great here in Hierarchy, you're in a commercial pack with the Star Realms of Shar. 
Star Realm of Shar is no longer a valid rival for our empire. So we're going to need to find yet another rival. Someone who is not pathetic. Now it's kind of sad. Even on the highest difficulty, I am having a hard time getting rivals. So Hierarchy of Mothith will be my next rival. Or better yet, the Interstellar Vicarians. But I'll have to wait till October to do that because it doesn't update your rivalries mid-month. Now I could see, let's see if I save it and reload if I can pick a rival right now. Okay, now that we have reloaded, we'll go down to the Interstellar Precarians. And yes. Saving and reloading allowed me to go ahead and adjust my rivalries now. Tendra Zun is in a non-aggression pact with the Star Realms of Shar. How are you doing on your... Uh, Mega structure. You're only at 25% generation efficiency. That's going to take two more upgrades after this one to get to full. Next one, will, uh, this one will do 50%. Next one will do 75, and the last one will actually finish it. And they haven't started upgrading this Dyson Sphere. I have decided to support the Charter of Workers' Rights, so it will be the next one in the queue. The Senate will only be in recess for three more months. This is one I can deal with. It gives workers a little bit more political power. That will not affect slaves. That will only affect free workers. And gives them a little happiness. Again, that will not affect slaves. But it gives me more diplomatic weight from population. And I have quite a bit of population. Now, I ended up closing the merchant locations in a lot of the locations that they had them. Probably something I should have done a while ago. Those are ones where they can downgrade to other jobs. And I'm going to go ahead and see how that works out. Right now, I don't believe any of them... Yeah, no valid auto-migration destinations because there aren't any ruler jobs available, but there are specialist jobs available here. So they don't feel the need to migrate. Let's have another look at, Kev at Font of Knowledge. It's only dropped 300 in the past three months, I believe. So we've still got another six, uh, probably another year, honestly, before we will bother invading. Hopefully, St. Hossack will get rid of its crime by then. We're about two months away from bathing Breslin. Federician League is in a defensive pact with the Gudgen Commonwealth. Huh. Now let's see, if I declare war on the Gudgen... It gets the Federicians and the nation of Selnok Prime, but not... The star, uh, the star realm of Shar. What if I did the nation of Selnok Prime? It would be just the Gudgen Commonwealth of them. But declaring war on the Gudgen Commonwealth, even though I can't reach them. The uh, Latrepians can. So the Latrepians would most likely handle that for me. And I would be able to beat down the Veteresians and maybe make some claims. Like get the Eye of Ball away from them. And perhaps this cluster. I don't see their capital. Both of these have the exact same icon for sector capitals. Ah, their capital is Bombala. Our 
operative in the Fell Null Cooperative has become spooked, raising concerns that their cover may have been blown. Let's uh, give them their extra resources. We can get that 10 infiltration level back fairly quickly. Let's go ahead and have a look at the Fell Null. So yeah, it takes about a year per level. So yeah, it'll be a 10 years to get that back, actually. <laughs> a little bit longer than I was expecting, but I'm not that worried about their intel. We established sleeper cells in the Veterician League. So I can relocate this spy. And that spy needs to go back to the Gloss for Heenies. We have bathed Breslin. So we will now send the Palpatine to the entryway to Jalora. It'll take four months to get there. It looks like we'll be coming straight to Jalora through the gateway. But yeah, we want to... Actually, let's pop over to Valamar. That will take about the same time. It'll only take two months for the Fortress Legionnaires to get over there, so we can hold off on sending them until the Palpatine is closer. Construction complete. Senate is now in session for the Charter of Workers' Rights, which I decided to support since it was going to pop up anyway. Ullis Station has finished its construction. This is my anchorage. in the system with strategic coordination center. I don't have a crew quarters or a mercenary garrison here because I don't intend to leave a fleet here. This is for hydroponics and resource silos. Now let's check Mel Pominia. Yeah, it takes about five years for them to demote. Says he's demoting straight to worker not stopping on the way to artisan or specialist but I'll just keep an eye on them to see if they migrate while I was going through my maintenance cycle it occurred to me I'm not making the best use of my domestic servants for the most part I had been treating them as robots that could be entertainers they're either an entertainer or a clerk. And it's only until recently I have started actually shifting them over to be actual servants instead of clerks in areas that needed a bit more amenities. But there's an even greater benefit here that I haven't been taking account of. And let's, let's look at Leffingwell and go into detail on sources of amenities. Now, politicians, most rulers provide a little bit of amenities. Uh, three points of amenities from each of my ruler classes here, the merchants and the politicians. Other than that, your main source of amenities is going to be entertainers. Now, entertainers, what is used the Fareen, they have the exact same bonuses as my Fila Dolans. Entertainers provide at base one unity and ten amenities. With the traits I have given my domestic servants, they would provide, actually they would provide a little bit more unity. I think they provide 2.25 or something like that. But they provide just about double the uh, unity and they provide 12 amenities. So one entertainer, 
one population is providing 12 amenities. That is four times what the ruler class is providing. So this is your best bang for the buck population uh, count to get amenities. So if you're looking to spend as few population as possible on providing the amenities you need to either keep your people content or maximize the citizen pop happiness, entertainers are the way to go. However, they do cost consumer goods. And they are also specialist, which means if they are not a slave species, they also have an upkeep of consumer goods from the living standard. Uh, right here, the uh, humans are using 2.6 for their job and half a point just about for living standards. So if this was a free population, they would actually need about one and a half consumer goods in addition to the food, which they would then convert into a little bit of unity and amenities. So if you're not running a slave empire, entertainers are usually going to be your best bang for your buck. Now if we drop down to clerks, the next source of amenities. Now in the current iteration of the game, you also have traders, which are another specialist. They only provide two um, amenities, but they provide eight trade value. So they're more a source of trade value than a source of amenities. The amenities are just kind of an afterthought for them, kind of like the unity is an afterthought for entertainers. Now, if we drop down to clerks, clerks provide four trade value and two amenities base in the this version of the game, which I believe is 3.7.4. In the current version of the game, they provide three trade value and three amenities that can be further enhanced through the mercantile tradition tree to four of each. So you can you will actually get even base more amenities from clerks uh, in the current version of the game than I do in this one. But in this one, it takes five clerks to provide the amenities that one entertainer does. The advantage of clerks is they are not specialists, so you would have lower upkeep if you had different economy levels where your different strata required different consumer goods. And anybody can work a clerk job. Even one of my regular slaves that is a chattel slave and are stuck at worker class can be a clerk. It doesn't have to be a specific class to work, uh, to work as a clerk job. But the main benefit of them, of course, is they don't require anything other than the food, but you require more of them to get the same amount of amenities. However, they are providing trade value. In this version of the game, it takes five clerks to equal one entertainer, but those five clerks will in, in turn generate 25 trade value. And all of that comes at a cost of 6.25 food converted into 25 trade value which converts directly into energy credits. So I would basically be converting 6.25 food into 25 energy credits. That's almost, that's a little over four, no, that's exactly four energy credits per unit of food, which is a lot more than just selling it. So if you are generating a decent amount of surplus food because you have worlds that are very heavy agriculture, like Rattenberry over here, has a bunch of agriculture districts. And the reason I like to make use of this as agriculture, even though I could make it mining or even industry, is that is a lot of workers that will benefit from one building. The food processing center affects every farmer and I can have a lot of farmers here. There are 14 agriculture districts, that's 28 farmers that will be benefiting from one building. And when I get a orbital ring, I can put one building on it to boost them all even further. Right now, without the orbital ring, 
Maya Rintho Rincholin is producing 27.32 food. Since my population requires 1.25 food apiece, let's drop that down to 25 after taking what he's eating. Every five points would support four population. So 25 points would support 20 population. One worker is supporting 20 population. And that 25 food, if all 20 of that population had no other job to work other than clerks, they would be turning that 25 food into 100 energy credits. And yes, that seems like it's not the most efficient use of a population, but sometimes you make do with what you can. I mean, there may be nothing else I can do other than have a world that has a huge amount of food and then have a habitat that has nothing but clerks on it just to convert it over into a little bit of energy credits because I may be lacking on places where I can build for energy credits. So every job really has value, just the exact value depends upon your play style and the hand you're dealt in the galaxy. But back to Proclaws or Leffingwell. So five clerks take the job of one entertainer. So I would be getting about 25 energy credits out of it and not using a consumer good. So if I'm low on consumer goods or I want to spend more of my consumer goods on things like bureaucrats and other uh, researchers, other specialists, possibly even culture workers who tend to gener uh, require even more, then making use of clerks is a good idea. Especially because since I use slaves, they have reduced housing requirements. As a slave, their base is 0.75, and then I take another 20% off, dropping it to 0.6 for my domestic servants. So five of these guys only uses three housing. However, despite their housing usage, they still count as one population for purposes of planetary capacity. While what I just said was technically correct, that pops count as a full pop regardless of housing usage for planetary capacity, uh, for comparing to planetary capacity, planetary capacity does also take into account unused housing. Now the way planetary capacity is calculated, every pop adds one to planetary capacity. So technically this is a 105 capacity planet. Every unused district adds a factor equal to, um, it's modified by the planet class. The default planet class adds four. So an unused district slot would increase the planetary capacity by another four. And then available housing modifies it. So since I have less than zero available housing, my planetary capacity is 102. I have no available districts. I have 105 pops, so my planetary capacity should be 105, but I have three unavailable housing, so the capacity is now 102. Because housing does affect it, available housing would increase it further. For example, let's see if I can find a planet here. I have 108 available housing. So that's adding 108 to the capacity on top of the 236 for my population. So the total should be 344. It's 344. So your housing usage does affect planetary capacity in a way. While this number will still be one for your population, if you have a population that uses less housing, for example, a domestic servant using half, the domestic servant adds one to planetary capacity. That half a point would affect your housing, which would affect how much planetary capacity is added from housing. So there is a factor in using domestic servants for planetary capacity because housing is as long the only way to exceed planetary capacity is to exceed your housing 
Every pop provides one planetary capacity, so the only time you will exceed planetary capacity is when you have no available districts and housing is a negative number. It will be whatever your population is minus your housing will end up being your planetary capacity. But I wanted to put that clarification in here. Now if we look down at the servants, the servants provide 4.8 amenities. It's four base. So I got two base out of these. One servant provides twice as many amenities as a clerk. So instead of needing five clerks to replace one entertainer, I would only need three or two and a half actually, but round up to three, three domestic servants to replace one entertainer. Now the biggest benefit of this is domestic servants don't require a job. I could have all the other jobs filled and still be able to move domestic servants over here. And further on top of that, they have a further half a point off of their housing requirement. So their base now becomes 0.25, further reduced by 20% by my traits, meaning these guys only take 0.2 housing. Now since they require 0.6 housing as an entertainer, these three that are replacing an entertainer require the same amount of housing. But it might actually be worthwhile for me to get rid of the leisure arcologies on my Acumenopoli and just have a whole bunch of unemployed domestic servants down here. It would take up the same amount of housing and free me with more districts to either dump into foundries or administration or something else. So I may start looking into that of getting rid of the leisure arcologies out of my plans and shifting over to more administration instead so that I am providing even more humans jobs. Now the advantage of clerks is you usually get some free clerk slots with most, well with city districts you'll get clerks slots for free on most of your planets and you also end up with bonus clerk slots if there is a megacorp in your game that puts a branch office on your planet because yeah each of these is provide I'm getting six the six clerk jobs I have down here are coming entirely from the branch office I have nothing providing these clerk jobs so I've just gotten these for free and of course they provide a little bit of energy credits so they're worth making use of when I can but replace uh, closing out the clerk jobs even and just having a whole bunch of unemployed domestic servants would allow me to get rid of the leisure districts on most of my EQ monopoly and shift them over to something more useful and there's also my research habitats now this plan I came up with for the research habitat is pretty much from my United Nations of Earth playstyle. Assuming all the populations are free pops, I was going to need, uh, I wanted to maximize my research districts, use a research institute, I of course want the culture building on here, and that left me two free slots. Well I didn't want to waste a district on entertainers, I would rather have that providing researchers so I would put a hollow theater on here and because housing was going to end up being tight I would need a luxury residence because I did not want to waste a district on habitation however since I have slaves and specifically domestic servants who aren't going to need much housing and don't need a building for jobs doing away with this building completely. I could put a research complex on here and a, a fully upgraded research complex would provide six jobs but it would cost two exotic gases. Exotic gases I have the most of and I'm not working all, I've got a lot of my exotic gases jobs 
closed down to push people to working chemist jobs. But if I had six researchers here, I could shift two of these districts over to housing. And then I could get rid of this building and put another research complex on here and have six more researchers to replace the six I just got rid of so that I would be at a grand total of six more than I have now. I would have 30 researchers instead of 24 on this world. And I would still have the hypercoms and the research institute. And all of my amenities would come from domestic servants who would take 0.2 housing apiece, so three of them would be equivalent of one entertainer now. And housing is pretty close in this. This provides four housing. Each of these provide three housing. So replacing two of these with a habitation with habitation districts would be ten extra housing. Now I would lose four housing from dropping this. So I would end up with six extra housing, which would be exactly how much housing I would need to support the six extra researchers I would put in here. Because I believe they each require a full point of housing. Yes. So I would still be fairly close to my housing cap, even swapping that around, but I would manage to squeeze some more research out of this. And I don't care if I'm over capacity on housing and this place stops growing population, that's fine. I have other places, the Cubanopoli I have, have a bonus to population growth. I don't mind that I will be really close to planetary capacity and shut down growth on here because I don't have any place for a population to go if they grow here anyway. They would end up either being unemployed or displacing someone, and I don't want either of those cases. But I, I could fit, let's say, right now, this would be five more domestic servants, because they're two and a half apiece. And I've got these two down here, so I would have seven right there. If I had six more of these guys, each of them require 0.85 amenities, six more would be 48 and 30, or 4.8 and 0.3, which would be 5.1. Two extra domestic servants giving me a total of nine down here, which would end up being 1.8 more over in housing capacity. That's that's not a big deal. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to run an experiment here on Varba. I'm already getting ready to replace the hollow theaters with research labs. And once I get it upgraded, I'm going to shift over to habitation districts and then replace this with another research lab and run my experiment and spam over some philodolins that I, I believe Caricia has quite a few it can spare. Let's look at it. We have five philodolins here right now, so I could shift some off of there. Mm -hmm. I probably have some surplus philodolins elsewhere being grown right now. So I could shift some more philodolins over here to find out exactly how much it takes to run Varba perfectly and then replan my other research habit stations off of that. Now for my mining and generator stations, I will probably keep the same setup I have. I mean, there's not really another building I would want to put here, other than maybe a precinct, uh, I could replace the clone vats, and the hyper entertainments with say a precinct house and a slave processing facility and then end up spamming workers down here these three would be equivalent to the housing i would have for the enforcers so that would give me three points of housing i might be able to do it i might be able to replace the the hyper entertainments here with the precinct house and when I'm done with the clone vats, shift it over to a slave processing facility and just use domestic servants as my source of amenities. So that may be something I can look into for my reactor 
and mining stations. Now, as for my refinery stations, all of my building slots are already used up. I did originally have a leisure district here, but then I realized I could reach amenity cap with just clerks. And I wasn't really making use of any other districts. I don't really need a habitation district. So just doing trade districts here, not only am I getting amenities, I'm getting a little bit of energy credits back for the food expenditure of the population. So that works out. And it would probably be about the same if I decided to do a unification station or a fortress station. Either one of those, they, there are no districts that really matter for them. So I would do trade districts to get my amenities. As for building slots, I know I would, like a, a fortress station, I would want as many fortresses as possible. I would probably still want one culture building, so it would be three fortresses, but I could do four fortresses if I skipped the culture building. And as for unification stations, they would end up very similar to my research because they would have two bureaucrat buildings, the culture building and then the auto curating vault to process that. Of course, I could give up the culture building for yet more bureaucrats. Now, they would probably need two habitation districts, but then I could spam the rest as trade to get uh, clerks. I don't know. I haven't looked into a unification station recently. But again, domestic servants have a lot more utility than I've been making use of. I believe I'm going to start making use of it. I may start shifting some others during my maintenance cycles. Now, I had just been making use of domestic servants because of the fact they weren't unemployed. But honestly, all they provide are amenities at reduced housing but require food. Whereas a clerk is at least giving you trade value. Now these guys do give more amenities than a clerk, but that's all they provide are amenities. But on the worlds that didn't need that much, like Geonosis, it only requires 31. It does not need 158 available amenities. So a lot of these servants are slaves that are eating and not providing any benefit for my empire. But I'd just been sticking them there so that I didn't have to micromanage them elsewhere at, a time, at the time. In the future, I'm going to start making more efficient use. I'm still trying to offload a lot of species I did not want. And after I get done thinning them out and start on my new colonies, things will turn out a little differently. But I could probably spare, on almost all of my worlds, entertainment slots, which gives me an extra building to do something with. I mean, the, the one benefit of entertainers is if housing is a very critical issue, it is a good way to get the amenities I need with the fewest number of pops. But as I showed, one entertainer and three domestic servants use the same housing as, as the slaves I have. So there's really no reason for me to bother with entertainers with my domestic servants unless I wanted the other benefits of the entertainer which was a small amount of unity. That's the only other benefit I'm getting. Now when I shift away from feudal society one of the civics I was considering was warrior culture which changes entertainers into duelists and instead of consumer goods, they would require alloys and they would provide naval capacity. So if I was planning to switch to warrior culture, retaining the entertainer slots would have value. If I don't switch to warrior culture, doing away with entertainers and making full use of domestic servants has more value. This would also boost my army damage capacity. I'm not really going to be doing much invasion anymore. And would give me another mercenary enclave. I have plenty. 
I could go to police state. That would give me an overall plus five stability and unity from enforcers. Because I do have a lot of enforcers. That's a building that has very little value to me for the United Nations of Earth. But has had a lot of value to me in this playthrough. Is the precinct house and hall of judgment. I never had stability issues in a xenopho of xenophile empire. It's only here where I've got slaves that I actually need enforcers to keep the stability up and to keep the crime down. Because the slaves are very unhappy and are providing a lot of crime. So having them generate a little bit more unity and more stability? That actually seems like it would be the one to replace it with. Because I am going to lose, take a stability hit when I get lit, rid of the Latrepians. <coughs> because if I look at the benefits for them being a bulwark, I'm getting a plus five stability bonus for having a relay network. So, I will be losing 5 stability on every world when I no longer have a bulwark. If I turn around and replace that with police state, yeah sure I'll get 10% less crime reduction, but as I explained in a previous episode, that 10% crime reduction is only crime in excess of what you are already suppressing. So it doesn't, if I have sufficient enforcers to keep crime at zero, it's not having any effect at all anyway. And I've already got the penal colony and artificial moral codes giving me 40% reduction to crime in excess. That extra 10% is just a little bit. It's mainly the stability that was going to hurt me. Because while I have 100% stability on my capital, because the capital itself provides stability, most of my colonies run about 70 to 80. Which means a 5% would be a pretty good drop. Now, we're not capped on resource output from jobs in most of these. And that's something that was quite different from my United Nations of Earth game, since I could keep everybody close to 100 happiness. My stability was just about capped on every world there anyway. But yeah, that's a little bit about sources of amenities and the different uses for them. Entertainers, when you want to use as few pops as possible. Clerks, because they're free with city uh, districts and also provide a little bit of energy credits without costing consumer goods. And if you are running slaves, domestic servants are the way to go. They use less housing and they provide more amenities than clerks and they do not require any particular building or district slot. You can throw them on any world, and I should have been making use of that quite a while ago. Before we proceed onward, I want to go to one of my Thrall worlds and show you all something. Now, previously I had showed you to uh, get an update on the UI, just favorite a job. Make sure you favorite a job that has a capacity. There are two jobs that do not have a capacity. One is servants, the other is toilers. A good way to really screw up how you have carefully put your populations is to favorite one of those. It will pull everybody pretty much out to work these jobs. And now I have to slowly get them feeling back in. And now we're back. Now, one advantage that does if you have domestic servants on a Thrall world is it will cut down on the number of toilers you have in favor of domestic servants. Of course, if I did the opposite, it would do away with my domestic servants here entirely, and I would end up with a whole bunch of toilers who are less effective than domestic servants. If we look at them real quick, servants provide four amenities for their base upkeep. Toilers provide two amenities for the same upkeep. So toilers are 
domestic servants that aren't domestic servants. Uh, any Anybody can be a toiler just like anybody can be a clerk. You don't have to be a domestic servant. You could be a chattel slave and still be a toiler. So that's the advantage of toilers is on Thrall Worlds you can't really create a lot of clerk jobs. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I could build commercial zones. No, you can't. You cannot create clerk jobs. These are your default clerk jobs and they are half as effective as a domestic servant. And they use the full housing, whereas the domestic servants at least have a half a point of housing reduction. Now, for some reason, one of my spy networks has kind of disappeared. I could have sworn here in the Felnall, I was preparing sleeper cells. I'm missing a person who was doing it, so I think it's going to be popping up soon. There it is. Sleeper cells in the Felnall have just been established. I do not want to use my scientist. I was wondering when that was going to pop up because I was checking the Fel Null to see how much progress I've made on getting them up to 100 because I now need to shift this person over to the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung to build a sleeper cell there. And I think I will go ahead and do that and then come back here to build up infiltration level. First, let me record when I'll need to do this again. April of 2482. And I'll just, after I get the sleeper cells established over here with yeah, the Citizens Alliance of Morgan Fung, yeah. before they drop below 100, I'll jump back to the Fel Null and just leave them there to build it back up. Now, I did not keep the amount banked, so I'm going to have to wait till April to start this. I ended up getting enough influence banked. I decided to go ahead and start on another habitat. We are working on Tumbleweed Station, which will be a mining habitat. And then we will proceed over to Marble. And the next habitat we build will be a research habitat. Battle debris secured. We got 1,500 alloys in Nathupa, one debris left. Holy Sildoran League was given association status with the Allied Independent Systems. You know, before this game is over, I'm going to see the death of the Allied Independent Systems. I forgot to check Naritum. Yes, it used the two specialists I had up here that I had moved over instead of dragging up the medical workers. Now, as you saw on... Broadleaf, that did not work. It still moved up the medical worker, and I realize now why. If we go back to Broadleaf, that person who jumped up here was a parahuman. The parahumans are more effective at producing unity than regular humans. So this medical worker I had favorited, he jumped up for two reasons. One, he was better suited to be a politician than a regular human. And two, there were other people who could take his job. I had an additional Praku, I think, either working as a metallurgist or a culture worker. And they, he knew as soon as he vacated that, someone else could fill the job. So he left. If there had been no one else to fill the job, he should have remained. But it was also the fact that he was better suited to being a politician than this human was. That was part of the problem. Violent clashes between armed gangs that run criminal underworld on Sahat Kasim have recently escalated. Street fighting has erupted in several urban centers, with the planetary authorities struggling to contain it. Collateral damage has been heavy. Fifteen devastation. So apparently there was another world that still had a criminal underworld besides St. Hossack, and that was Sahat Kasim. But I have sufficient 
enforcers here to keep it at zero, so that'll disappear eventually. We just ended up with a little bit of devastation, unfortunately. Well, we're exterminating the original population anyway. My vat-grown clones will replace them. In April, I will begin the attack on the archives. Right now, the Palpatine is passing through Jalora, took the gateway over here to go over there and get in position. So I've got to wait until it gets Field to Field engineers have cleared a blocker. So actually, it'll be four days after my maintenance, April 5th, they will be out of this system. I can declare war and move in. And it'll take him about a month. Yeah, close to a month to get over here to where he can use the hyper lane where I have Fortress Legionnaires already ready. So as soon as I, he clears, I can drop them as a subject, declare war on them, and proceed in to clear them out. Oh, that was Sahat Kazim that just cleared a blocker. I think there was a sinkhole there. And even though it was about to go away when the terraforming completed, I wasn't doing anything else. I figured I'd clear it because there is a chance to create an archaeological site from clearing blockers. Mainly it's jungle, but I think any blocker can do it. I got a little carried away during my maintenance cycle and ended up shifting all of my worlds to start the process of removing entertainers. Quite a few were fairly easy to do, such as Unity. I was able to close down all the entertainer slots because the servants were sufficient to keep my amenities up. I did have to transfer a handful over from other worlds, but I have three worlds that have a tremendous amenity surplus. And I had my thrall worlds, which also had an amenity surplus. So I ended up shifting over more populations here and shutting down a lot of the clerk jobs that are granted by holdings. So almost all of my worlds are in the process of shifting over to get rid of their entertainment, except for the ones whose construction queues were already busy. And I do have a handful more I have to flip over. Now, it drained about 30,000 energy credits, all of the transfer of population resettlement I was doing, because I also ended up resettling humans. Any world I had where there were humans working jobs intended for slaves, I tried my best to consolidate them on my Ecumenopoli and research stations, places that needed humans. I've still got a few out and about. And another thing occurred to me, so this war plan is about to be canceled. When you release a subject, there is a 10-year peace treaty. So I am, if I want this to be the most effective or the quickest way, I am going to have to renegotiate agreements with these vassals and absorb them. Because if I release them into a peace treaty for 10 years, they are going to get snagged up by one of my opponents during those 10 years. So I think I'm just going to have to resume banking influence and absorbing these guys slowly. I'll start with the smallest ones. I think um, Brienne and Stellar Nation would probably be the quickest. It's going to take about 50 to renegotiate an agreement with them, so I will probably have to begin that in July, or at least renegotiate the agreement in July. But yeah, we need to resume absorbing our vassals, because the war route frees them to join my enemies. Also, even if I was planning on releasing them to go to war, I had completely forgotten about the troops that were stationed on the world as a garrison that I would need to pull. So they would have been lost in transit if I had proceeded when the Palpatine had made it where it was going. Now when we click over a month, we'll see just how affected my economy is 
on some of my worlds I had to shut down food or minerals and in a few rare cases technician jobs to be able to free construction up complete domestic servants who were working those jobs to be able to close out entertainers <laughs> Leffingwell station finished its current construction which was the alloy processing facilities I lacked the influence to start on the next habitation module now some of my higher end stuff like consumer goods and alloys should get a bump because some of the humans I moved over to a human opoli in preparation for building Battle debris secured admin uh, districts there are filling currently filling up either metallurgist or artisan jobs 800 alloys for the final debris here let's for now let's send the arbiter we'll have to decloak for this over to Ditrum to assist cloaking detection It'll take them two months to get over there but that's what we'll have them doing when we're not using them not that it matters I'm fairly disappointed in cloak the fact that even if you specialize a small amount it's basically useless late in the game once people get access to citadels because all it takes is a citadel with six detection arrays to bust the highest cloak I really think the detection arrays by themselves should not be enough you should need a scientist assisting research to make cloak useless and it appears I re-upgraded that uh, orbital ring I don't see the construction anymore here in Hillos. Yes, the Tarteso station is online. I must have missed that. You know, in the meantime, while we don't have the influence for this, I could throw an anchorage or two on here just to cut down on how much resources I'm losing, but that does mean my constructor should be uh, able to begin the mega shipyard. Alright, now that we've clicked over a month, yes, I am still positive in energy credits, but just barely. Looks like I've dropped about another thousand in minerals. And alloys has gone up by about a thousand. Consumer goods didn't go up as much as I thought, only about 500. We got a chunk of minerals and energy credits and food from the Fortress Legionnaires. We have completed the construction of the orbital ring in the Rackeron system. I'm not sure I gave you a follow up order. I did not. Well, Rodoman would be the next one to uh, enter orbit of here. Novalis is now online. And Naritum has been converted into a continental world. Adnoran Kingdom broke their migration treaty with the Star Realm Ashar. So let's do a quick check of the font of knowledge here. It's getting there. It's about even with us now. So yeah, it is going down about 300 uh, every cycle. So that's about 100 a month it drops. In about six months, I should be able to begin the invasion. Now let's renegotiate the deal with the Brienne and Stellar Nation. We're going to end up giving them some resources. And joining all of their wars. Still 120. Let's 
67. I thought I'd gotten it down to 53 before. They must have grown just a tad. Now, it's going to be a very small effect on our economy, except for the energy credits. That will be a drain for a bit. And it says we are lacking four to be able to do this. What if I did Pankisha? Ah, Pankisha was the one I'd gotten to the 50s before. So yeah, we will absorb Pankisha province. I was looking at some of my subjects' planets and the sorry state they are in. Pankisha, the one I'm going to integrate, has no human cyborgs at least. But it does have very bad stability and high crime. They haven't really done much with it. Now, why do they need so many city districts? They have 39 available housing. They could shift these city districts over into something more useful. If we look at the population, they do have some unemployment. And city districts only provide like one clerk job, whereas most of these other districts would provide two. So if they shifted a few city districts over, it would employ some of their unemployed pops. They could shift a few of these over to food and free these up for like more research. It's just a mess. It's, it's an absolute mess that they have here, and it is depressing. Now if we go to the archives, they actually do have two colonies. They have a habitat that I don't know anything about as to what districts it could get. But they have set it up with exotic gas refineries and a couple of commercial zones. But if we look back at their capital, look at the sheer number of city districts they're hanging on to. 105 available housing and no jobs to work. Now, granted, some of these buildings provide a decent amount, especially for a small empire. That's 250 energy credits being produced by this. Not bad. This is turning 20 minerals into 25 alloys. But you could get 25 alloys out of two or three industrial districts. And they have plenty of city districts to ship over to industry. It's just there is no real logic or rhyme or reason behind the way the computer main, tries to maintain its empire. And since I'm going to end up picking up a whole bunch of these horribly managed planets when I absorb them, I am sadly not able to bathe my own worlds to clean them up a lot quicker. I'm kind of thinking, at least with the Latrepians, I may hang on to them until they rebel. Because I would be able to immediately go to war with them if they tried to rebel. So I may just, you know, let their loyalty decline to the point where they want to break free of working with me. I did shift over the envoy I had improving relations with the Mirabandians over to building a spy network with the Latrepians so I can see if they're getting a secret fealty somewhere. If we look at the Mirabandian planets, robots, Kithin, and Mirabandia. So no human cyborgs will be picked up there. Here in Citadel, no human cyborgs. No, they do have a couple of human superiors. Those are cyborgs. So Citadel has a few I will end up having to offload. If we go to Bags Holdings, I do not see human superiors. There's one on Destinicon. And 16 on Bags. 
you know, as pitiful as these nations are, I may just end up cutting bags holdings loose and letting them ally with someone else and eventually take them over by force. Let's have a look at what we're getting from them. A small amount of energy credits, food, and minerals. A little bit of research. And a small amount of influence. Okay, so let's go to their capital. Yeah, they are working these jobs. So we're getting like 0.6. The Overlord Academics are producing 15 research basically between the two of them the propagandists are producing 0.7 influence and that is the extent of it so I really wouldn't lose a lot by cutting them loose and I could wait the 10 years to actually obliterate them the Osiris colonies do not have a human superior there are human superiors here on one world. So if I did absorb all of my other little empires, that would leave me with just a handful of human superiors to offload at some point. If I stick with the Latrepians until they betray, I could do the same trick I'm do trying here, which is wait until a planet is about to fall the under their claims and shift them over, or I could do a non-total war and if I invade a planet, I should be able to shift some of my people over there, even though I'll lose the planet after the war. New species variant available. I converted seven Orintho Rancholans over to Swedelands mm -hmm. on Flaxington, I believe. Let's see, Flaxington is here. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of the agricultural districts. So I converted the Orintho Rancholans I already had over to Swedelands. I'm going to shift three of these districts over to city districts to give me more housing capacity since this is one that I get gas plant engineers per population. And then the other four I'm just going to get rid of so I can switch this away from habitation modules over to, say, an anchorage. Now there is one more conversion I'd like to do real quick before the next uh, maintenance cycle so that I can start producing furbanites. At these, these three worlds that created young furbanites are going to need more, especially the two habitats. New sit rep. So I would like to have them converted to actual Furbanites so I can queue up the construction of more. Pankisha Province agreed. So we will begin integrating the subject. It's only going to cost 114. At five per month, that would be 23 months, about two years. 22 months. They rounded down. Construction complete. My three young Furbanites have been shifted over and Melpomenia Station finished its habitation module, but I did not have the influence at the time to queue up another one. I will go ahead and queue it up now. Actually, it can wait. I will hang on to that influence for now and worry about that later because it does have more districts it can build and it is in the process of switching over leisure districts anyway. So I would rather have the influence banked for something more important. Forked Chain. A number of individuals belonging to the pre-sapient native population of Pelops somehow got into the secure compound on the outskirts of our colony. They were chased off within hours, but not before severely damaging several interstellar uplinks dedicated to currency transfers. We fear several hundred credits may have been lost in the ether. 
300. Uh, I'm losing that a month anyway right now. Oh, crap. I meant to check, Delphi. It did do it. Good. Delphi, I had uh, was in the process of building a ministry of production, and I had shifted over one of my unemployed ruler class, hoping that it would take it. Science Division report success. Mega art installation. An artistic beacon on a stellar scale. This installation inspires and represents the spirits of its creators. The interstellar assembly is available. You know, let's go ahead and get tracking implants. It boosts authoritarian ethics attraction, and I would like more authoritarians in my empire. At Norm Imperium has begun a sensor array. I think I will continue the bombardment till January. Construction complete. Vuzabaru Station has completed its construction queue. It now has its full allotment for a shipyard. Four shipyards, two torpedo batteries, crew quarters, fleet academy, a mercenary garrison for the fleet in defense, and a deep space black site because it has colonies there. And Vuzabaru Station should have its full defenses for now. Yep, 17 platforms is what I went with. I was leaving myself a cushion because I'm not sure what I'm going to lose when I drop them as a bulwark. Now, I may do that because right now they're bleeding me dry of like 2,000 energy credits, which I could use back. And I could drop down to where I'm not having to give them so many resources. But that is the minimum amount I can give them as a bulwark. One of the issues dealing with the management of a very large empire, and one of the reasons I prefer to keep my empire small, is it is easy, especially when you have a bunch of colonies, to lose focus of the bigger picture and focus on an individual colony's the plan you have for it. For example, I keep a plan of what I want Unity to turn into. So I could easily sit here and adjust what I'm doing for Unity purely based on Unity and Unity's growth without taking into account other factors. Now, right now, Unity's growth does not affect other factors. It gives me a place to dump humans, and I have a surplus of consumer goods, which they will be using, but I just had a plan individually for Unity, which I'm now shifting away from a little bit. I'm getting rid of the factories and the foundries on Unity, because I have other ecumenopoli that are either factory or foundry ecumenopoli, I'm going to shift all of these over to admin and change Unity entirely to an ad admin colony. So I will eventually be getting rid of the research complexes as well when I get Marble Station online in Deneb, which is the next habitat I intend to build after uh, after tumbleweed is done when it gets up and running and starts getting researchers I will start shifting these researchers to bureaucrats so that my overall unity production increases this will be pretty much pure bureaucrat and I will get rid of the civilian repli complexes and the aloe and nano plants and the ministry of production because there are other humanopolis that will be better for that. So this little bit of foundries and factories isn't sufficient to hang on to. I would rather really increase my admin capability so that it boosts my empire's overall unity. Now, part of the reason I'm in the strait I'm in is while all the information I need for managing colonies is available on the UI, it's not easily available in a consolidated report. So I had been keeping little notepad files so I knew uh, I could quickly 
reference when I was on another planet what species are on this particular planet or what they need and things like that. So I knew where to shift populations. And maintaining all of these little notepad files and going through takes a long time, so all of my maintenance may not take place in one block of time. It may have to be broken up and interrupted. I may only get, out of my 24 sectors, I may only get like six or seven done before I don't get back to the game for a while. So it was easy to lose track of the bigger picture. But that said, I, I have uh, gone through. There were a couple of colonies I needed to adjust. I was shifting them over in preparation to become a Cumanopoli, but I need the mineral and energy production for now, so I had to undo what I had done. I was focusing on them as a colony and how I wanted them to proceed rather than how it would affect my overall empire. A note on the detection stations is no, they do not pass through gateways. Ditrum itself has a sensor range of nine, so it's getting a, a cluster of nine around here. The reason I keep popping them over here when they enter Lindula is Bergalfa Station, one of my sub-vassals, has a detection strength of six. And because we have unified sensors, their detection strength applies to me and is popping that. So the larger your empire, the more detection arrays you're going to need staggered around. So I have started planning more. Valimar Station will be a detection array, but I don't need a huge amount of detection. I checked pretty much all the other empires, and they're around three to four. Which, again, is a disappointment for me with Cloak, because even with a good admiral, you can gain a couple extra points. So with the best cloaking field generator most people can get access to, five is your maximum detection. It's six when you can get a dark matter cloak, or seven if you get access to the psionic cloak. And of course, traditions and other things can affect it and push it up further, so you could eventually get ten. But it is extremely easy for anybody to get six cloaking detection, which means anything short of psionic cloak is useless on. And I kind of wish it was more along the lines of Star Trek, where cloak is meaningful. There are weak cloaks and stuff like that that could probably be detected by other means. There are ways they've detected cloak Romulan ships and the like, but for the most part, cloak is meaningful. It's not completely stymied once people get citadels. So my energy credits don't grow because I have so much shuffling of population to do because I had been allowing populations to just grow whatever and shift them to worlds that need them. However, that ends me up with a surplus of humans that are on worlds that don't need war uh, humans and those are the most expensive to shift around. So I have been on some of my other worlds, such as say Pollen, well no, Pollen Cloud, I'm allowing one more human to grow because he was so close. Kicking in prioritizing species. It's only a 10% penalty to pop growth. So I have 50% bonus normally. So the force growth is only dropping it by uh, by 10% to 140%. And this species is fertile, which is another 30. So it's not a huge effect, and it allows me a little bit more control. And after this species is grown, I can clear this to any species again. And if it starts growing a human, I'll just force growth again on the next one. And that way I have a little bit more control over that, and it will end up spending less energy credits. It will slow down my population growth slightly, but my population's growing steadily anyway. So don't get me wrong about the micromanagement. I actually enjoy this level of micromanagement in games. It just gives me a feeling of accomplishment. <laughs> Coming up with a plan and watching things steadily go toward that plan. 
We established Seeper Cells in the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung. I could get rid of my Economist asset. No. I don't think Orkham Fung is going to be that big of an issue. So now I can move that envoy back to the Fel Null from the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung, but I can't do that for another three months. Because you do it, so it took me less than a year to get yeah, over here and establish yeah. sleeper cells, which is good to know. And they'll be good for another 15 years. Yeah, I'm still losing a significant amount of energy credits, but I'm not going to bleed completely dry soon. So, next maintenance cycle, I need to start focusing on my generator stations and worlds that have energy production and make sure I am maximizing that. Yeah, because it just dropped a little more. Now that is mainly due to the fact that I am still reinforcing fleets. And I'm already over my capacity. I do have the worlds with strongholds focusing on strongholds and furbanites. So my, hopefully my naval capacity will increase soon. But I do not want to stop building ships because I want to get all the fleets I have planned built to increase my overall strength to make it less likely that other empires will attack me right now until I am ready to proceed forward. Terraforming on Sahat Kasim has finished faster than initially estimated which left us with time to experiment. We can either add amenities or add happiness and an immigration pool. Ten amenities would mean I would need three less domestic servants to support the amenities, whereas a 5% overall happiness is much more effective. Does it have to look so artificial? So Hasat Kasim is now a continental world because happiness affects approval rating which affects stability and stability affects resources from jobs which actually makes tracking implants rather useless if I haven't mentioned this before it reduces crime by 10 but it reduces happiness by 10% now, every 10% happiness below 100 is 0.2 crime. So if I have 50 pops on a planet, I've already nullified that minus 10 to crime that they're doing, and more than 50 pops means extra crime on the world. The difference will be on worlds that are heavy on my worker class slaves because they have nerve stapled and are unaffected by happiness so crime will be reduced on those worlds and slaves that are already at zero or five percent but those are captured slaves my regular slaves are all at least 15 so running this especially on my ecumenopoli that have large populations such as unity has 236 population crime is going to skyrocket because every pop on here is not I don't have any of my worker class nerve stapled slaves every pop on here has happiness that it can lose my Fila Dolans are at 24 percent happiness here right now so 10 percent will be an extra point to crime per pop every single pop on here will get point to extra crime with the exception of the slaves that I'm getting rid of that were low anyway, but my regular ones like the Samolans, 24% happiness, so they'd lose 10% and add 0.2 more crime. Now that, in effect, will mean I would need even more enforcers to keep it in check. Right now, with eight enforcers I am just barely meeting the crime but there's not much more development for unity as a matter of fact crime will be going down 
as I replace the ca the conquered slaves with my own because mine have more happiness and produce less crime. And it would get back up to probably this point, but not only that, the humans would end up actually adding more crime because most of them are providing very little, but they would each end up adding another point too. And I have a lot of humans on this world. So overall, that would mean I would need an additional hall of judgment to keep that in check. And I really don't want to spare another building slot. I've already had to sacrifice some buildings on other worlds as they go to Ecumenopolis that are really heavy on my slaves. I only had a handful of factory and foundry districts, grand total of 10. And I needed a full hall of judgment to be able to handle that. On some worlds, I have 13 to 18 of these planned, which means I'm gonna have more slaves with lower happiness which means more crime, and they are going to end up needing two halls of judgment to handle that. So yes, this edict, it could be better. Sure, it's got authoritarian ethics attraction, and it boosts your encryption by one, but the happiness to crime ratio isn't good enough. I think this edict should be a minus 25 to crime, it should count as a free enforcer. That would make it worthwhile. Because the happiness already has an additional penalty. The 10% happiness is going to affect your overall stability, which is going to affect your resources from jobs. At 100% stability, you get plus 30% resources from jobs. So that would be 6% less resources from jobs dropping it by 10% because it would drop the overall approval rating by 10%, everything being 10% less happy. And I think that really isn't that great. When all when you're not actually countering the crime you're creating from the happiness either. So not only will a population over 50 actually add crime, you're losing 6% resources from jobs as well. But I'm going to finish researching the tech just for more tech score since I've already started on it. But I don't think I'm ever going to run that edict. Construction complete. Tartesso station completed. I forgot to check it. It's orbital anchorage. We'll throw another one on there for now. And during my maintenance cycle, if it appears in January if it appears that I don't have anything else to spend the influence on I could actually there's no rush on this this one is going to be focused on mining for a while to help my minerals stay positive and I don't really see a point for habitation districts here after I've become an Ecumenopolis, I could shift those over to Habitation Districts for more. But this isn't a priority for becoming an Ecumenopolis anytime soon. I have better worlds to do that. This can remain a mining world for a significant amount of time. Alright, let's have a check on the font of knowledge here. I'll give it another year so that I have 50% more army than they do. And maybe in that additional year, St. Hossack will have completed its getting rid of its crime. So I can shift over the human cyborgs here. If after I have gotten rid of all my vassals, I haven't been able to offload the last few human cyborgs I end up with, what I will probably do is spin off a vassal from some sector I could spare. Maybe if I create a habitat back here in Wum Jiam and create a sector out of it, I could spin that off and then just move all my human cyborgs over there to blast them later. Now I was going to consider spinning off a vassal anyway. See, if I dropped them, They're a protectorate, 
So they are providing me with 0.25 influence, I think. I think I get 0.25 for them being a vassal. I mean, a protectorate, not a vassal. And probably 0.75 or so from the Ministry of Truth. And a small fraction of, yeah, less than 30 points worth of science. And about 30 energy credits. But if I drop them, somebody else will end up picking them up, but then I'll be able to reconquer them later. More than likely, though, the Star Realm of Shar would vassalize them. We can find out who might consider it by looking at opinion map mode and selecting them. Hisman protectors don't like them, but everyone else has positive relations with them. So yes, they are very likely to become subjugated by somebody else. What about Bags Holdings? Yeah, apart from the two, three fallen empires, everybody likes them. Same for Citadel. Oh, that's that's me. And the United Miravandians. So any of my subjects that I actually spin off are going to get gobbled up. Because everybody hates me except for the Hisman Protectors. All the shuffling of pops I am doing to maximize my amenities Basically, you have to have double what you need. Your pop amenity usage and your base amenities added together. So in this case, 37. As long as I'm over 37 amenities, I have the maximum bonus to happiness. And it does cost 50 energy credits to transfer even a slave. If I were to transfer the humans I would have been shuffling around are a little bit more expensive, depending on their class. Specialists are 250 and 25 unity, and rulers are 500 and 50 unity. But all of this shuffling around I have been doing, and spending a lot of energy credits, is for very little gain. It's something I'm going to continue to do, even though it's draining my economy just because of the way I am. But I just wanted y'all to know that it's not the most optimum way to play, especially, for example, with the Commonwealth of Man. Because this bonus to happiness only affects citizen pops. It's not affecting my slaves. And my citizen pops usually make up about two thirds of the approval rating. So I'm not even getting the full plus 20 to directly to stability. It'd be more like 13, but let's do, be generous and say 15%. Actually, let's be really generous and say we're getting the full 20% benefit. Every point of stability above 50 is 0.6 resources from jobs. It caps out at 30% bonus at, 50, at 100. So 20% would be 12% more resources from jobs. Now, if we look at... Let's actually go to one of my generator stations. If we look at one of my generator stations, a 20% output, again, this is not based on how much they're putting out, in this case, like 15 or 20. It's based upon the base value of the job, in this case, six. So, 12% of 6 is not even a full point. As a matter of fact, it's about 0.72. But let's be generous, and even more generous, and round it up to a full extra point we're getting for maxing out our pop happiness. That means I would end up getting 6 more energy credits. 
for having that maxed out. Of course, it's also going to affect any other jobs that have output, such as my culture workers and my rulers. But just for the purposes of workers, we're looking at them. That means six extra energy credits. It's not worth closing a job to make sure your bonus is maxed out because each of these jobs would provide more than six. So I am better off letting the amenities drop a little bit and work the job. And that was one of the reasons my energy credits were so low is I had foolishly decided, like here where there were 20 technicians, let's close four jobs to have four extra servants to keep our citizen pop happiness maxed. Well, closing those four jobs lost me 80 energy credits. And what I gained out of it was maybe 16 energy credits at most. And this one is about 60% determined by the rulers. So it wasn't even a full 16 energy credits I was getting. And I'm going to be correcting that in this maintenance cycle. So my energy credits should return back to being solvent and my minerals and food would also climb a little bit. So while the bonuses from amenities are nice for pop happiness it's not really critical unless your stability is below 50. Now if your stability is below 50 you lose 1% resource from job for every point below 50. So getting a even a 12% increase is 12% more resources from jobs. It, it will your amenity boost will push over directly to how much you're getting basically and offsetting that penalty. So that could be considered worth it keeping your amenities max when your stability is low and you're struggling for it. Especially if your stability is 25 or less. At, if your stability remains 25 or less for a year or more, you run the risk of a revolution. Also, if you have slaves, so for the Commonwealth of Man, if I remain at 40% stability or less for two or more years, I run the risk of an event popping up where the slaves begin radicalizing. And if that event pops up, for the next 20 years, the planet will have, or the colony will have a modifier of minus 20 stability, which makes it even more likely that that planet is going to revolt. So the break points really to pay attention to for stability is 25 is critical for everybody. 40 is important if you are a slaver and only if it's going to stay that way for at least two years. If you can keep it from staying that way longer than like a year or two, it's okay to drop back down a little bit, just as long as it's not for two years. And of course, you want to stay 50 or higher. Also, I believe I have come up with a solution for what I intend to do with the human cyborgs when I am done integrating all of my vassals, including the Latrepians. In the end, if I have human cyborgs that I do cannot decline and want to get rid of, the easiest solution is to pick a world that would be considered a border world to somebody I plan to attack. For example, the Miravandians or the Tendrazun, though I don't really want to border get rid of any of the border worlds here but I would pick a border world for somebody I plan to attack after I get the Latrepians I will have at least one colony here in Ridath this one so I could take this colony and stuff all of my human cyborgs on here along with surplus of other species I want to get rid of that I can spare and then I will cut that colony loose as a gift to another empire. I don't even need to have it in a separate sector. It can just be a colony by uh, in a larger sector. And I just tell the, like the Tendrazun, I come up with a message and say, 
okay, you can have this border colony and the system associated with it. And since this has a gateway, I could do this with any enemy I plan to attack. And as soon as they accept and it is under their control, I could initiate attack. And because now it is an enemy system, I could bathe it with my Colossus. So that is how I plan on eliminating the final human cyborgs for my empire when I have finished absorbing all of my existing vassals. Now the reason most of my other colonies got rid of their crime before St. Hossack did has to do with how you get rid of criminal modifiers. Crime related modifiers won't pop up unless you have 30 or more crime for about a year or two and then they can they can start popping up once criminal underworld or some of the other permanent modifiers have popped up regardless of crime level they can have modifiers like if gang wars is active you can have the gang war events pop up every couple of years and you only have to get crime down below 10 not all the way to zero to suppress these but it takes 15 years now that time is reduced in half multiplicatively for every enforcer you have so one enforcer drops it to seven and a half years two enforcers will drop it to under four years three enforcers will drop it to under two and four enforcers will drop it to under one year if you have five enforcers running it'll only it'll go away in about six months and Sahat Kazim has had four enforcers running for a while, so it's probably just about to get rid of its criminal underworld. And the other stations near St. Hossack actually built precinct stations and were running three. So they cut the time down to under two years. Well, St. Hossack has just been running one enforcer, so more than likely it'll probably take another year at least before it goes away there i did manage to get all of my useless domestic servants shifted to other worlds so there are no worlds that have a huge surplus of amenities there are a handful of worlds that do not have the plus 20 percent bonus and these with exclamation marks taro nexon issica hesperides cranadeth tendis and treadway also do not have their full jobs running because they had to struggle to stay positive on amenities so in places like nexon it was worth closing one or two jobs to make sure i stayed above zero so that i'm not suffering a huge penalty because two surplus is giving me 2.1 percent happiness if I open up this job. Four penalty is minus 14% happiness. That's double the amenity difference, but seven times the penalty. So yeah, I want to keep it positive, zero or higher to avoid severe penalties that will in turn affect stability because uh, I'm trying to keep my bonuses from stability going. I went ahead and renamed most of the planets I was terraforming because if you click on a planet that isn't occupied or is a different type, sometimes there's a different list of random names. That's where winter came from, but I'm not seeing any more Arctic names in this cycle. It's just flipping through the same few ones. So I got a couple of these. I think Cursonia was actually from the jungle world, Jangala. Uh, since it was still a jungle world, yeah, Cursonia and Shrub are options for it. So I just did random on a couple of different planets till I came up with some better names. High Ground was interesting. This actually was a random name for this arid world. And this place does have a weak magnetic field and low gravity. And I just think it's kind of interesting calling it High Ground since we could be able to jump pretty high there. Following a long uh, period of growing support for the Association of Research Efficiency, the Citizens Alliance for Confung has embraced materialism. 
I have sufficient naval coverage for an empire 50% larger than my own. They still only have one transport in orbit. You are about useless, Latrepians. United Nations of Earth are in a research agreement with the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung. Actually, we might be have the 50% bonus by July. At Norm Imperium is in a research agreement with the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung. And Kesem Confederacy is in a commercial pact with them. United Crest Commonality embraced the Committee of Unified United Scientists and became more materialist. Kraku Interstellar Nation is in a research agreement with the Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung. United Crest Commonality is in a research agreement with the Orkham Fung. All of a sudden, everybody is getting friendly with Orkham Fung. They're still a bulwark. They must have just opened up the ability to have treaties with other people. Soran is in a research agreement with them now. I bet you, because of how weak the Gloss Rohinians have become, they had to renegotiate the agreement with their vassal to allow them independent diplomacy. Aclaren Interplanetary Confederacy is in a commercial pact with the Citizens Alliance for Confung, and so is the Adnorum Imperium. And the Allied Maltics are now in a research agreement with them. Construction complete. Romstan Starbase has finally upgraded, so I can add more to its queue. Let's just go ahead and throw on a torpedo battery for now, since my maintenance is in a couple of days, and I'll get to it then. The Praku Interstellar Nation is in a commercial pact with the Orkham Fung. Yeah, my energy credits didn't jump as much as I had thought. They are positive now by about 200. My minerals went up uh, about 1,000. And my food jumped a little bit, uh, I think a couple hundred. But all of these, now that I have started getting my stations and stuff in order and prioritizing filling them out, it should go a little bit smoother now, and I should be able to recover from my momentary bout of stupidity. Unfortunately, Sahat Kasim popped up above 9% crime. It was at 10% when I checked it. If that happened during this maintenance cycle when I was shuffling pops, it's okay. But if it had happened when I shuffled pops last maintenance episode and I missed it, it means that the removal of the crime modifier would have been cancelled. So starting over on it again, the time will be reset to the 15 years. And since there's one enforcer there, it'll take about seven and a half years from here to clear it out, unless I get more enforcers over there. And in seven and a half years, I should have more enforcers over there. Probably in about two years, I could have one. Oh, I did forget to rename this Vaga Posh. Construction complete. Fincastle Station built another habitation module. So we now have two available district slots. I haven't needed to expand on it just yet. I'm going to wait until I fill up the jobs I have. Because available districts provide more planetary capacity than industrial districts do. These provide four, while these will only provide two from the housing. Construction complete. Solstice Station has finished its final construction. It is now fully switched over to an anchorage, I believe. I think it was the Naval Logistics Office or the Deep Space Black Site it was working on. I did begin putting slaves back on the market but the problem is while there's not a tremendous amount of lag on searching through this area 
except when you toggle species it will lock up for a little bit but as you see that that's not moving but I can still interact with the mouse just fine while it's sitting here populating the list however when I go to the slave market while navigating this seems fine the minute I click sell slaves this game will bog down to a crawl and I mean horrible crawl now the mouse cursor is still able to move but trying to scroll this list you see the delay on the tooltips I mean this list is atrociously slow to maneuver around and so trying to find a particular thing and I'm not sure if it's the number of colonies the number of slaves the number of different species that is causing this the minute I cancel it everything goes back to normal now when I do something like switching over a species let's see if we can find one with a large amount oh I know my uh, the Darblins there we go. If I go to switch over a species here, I can scroll this list just fine. And it has icons for the world and stuff, but it only does like the species icon once. But yeah, this one is, is no difficulty to navigate compared to the slave market, so I'm not sure why the slave market is more atrocious. A better way to put slaves on the market would be to allow us to do it from the planetary interface so for example if I wanted to sell a slave here on unity if I could like click on him and one of the options was sell on slave market then I wouldn't have to deal with that atrocious list star realm of Shar has joined the allied independent systems so now we have the star realm of Shar and the Soran both in the same federation and I don't think they like each other let's go back to opinion map mode now this also has a little bit no they do like each other yeah their mutual threats are me <laughs> we've gotten the gateway and Tazian online I can now connect this star base up to Deneb. Well, I guess I gotta let it advance a day. Now I can do it. There we go. And then that trade should be 100% shortly. Now, there is another thing I wanted to do that I had forgotten about until just now. I want to rearrange some sectors here. And you can't do that while the game is paused in this version. So I want to set Faunus as the capital. Let it update. Because I wanted to move your Quirlid into your this area and allow Ro Essek to claim all the all of these areas. Now we are going to go back to Navalis being the capital. And that will allow us to reclaim that area. And I will need to reorganize my planets a little because your Quirlid is moving into your Onderine. I think that was currently the only changes I really wanted to make at that time. Grand and Stellar Nation is in a commercial pack with the Star Realm of Shar. There's going to be a whole bunch popping up with construction complete. With the Star Realm of Shar now in the Federation. Melpomenia Station. I built a temporary anchorage until I get around to needing the habitation module. It still has a little bit of growth to do but that will give us a little bit of naval capacity in the interim. 
I misjudged how many star bases I was upgrading, apparently. I must have had one in the process of upgrading when I thought I had one extra star base capacity to keep upgrading, but the next stage or final stage of my strategic coordination center should be done in about two years, and that will give me four more star base capacity. Sovereign Tuxcali are in a research agreement with United Kresk. Yeah, All keep... sword ground elements are dropping on target. And I have begun the invasion over here in the Font of Knowledge because we had plenty of firepower to take them out. And I don't think we are going to free up St. Hossack's criminal in time. I'm going to get more anyway. I just want to go ahead and get this over with so I can get to other things. Scientist Kazina has developed new skills, expertise, Voidcraft. They're in the Pilgrim assisting research somewhere. Felnall is in a research agreement with the Shar. Glosswarhanian are in a commercial pact with the sovereignty of Tuchikali. Sovereignty of Tuxcali is in a commercial pact with the Kresk. United Nations of Earth broke their secret fealty with us. Didn't last long. Sovereign Jazajan are in a research agreement with the Sovereignty of Tuxcali, and the Aklaren are in a research agreement with the Mirabandia. Well, they're going through my clone troopers pretty quickly, actually. Jengala has terraformed into a continental world. Sovereign Jazajan are in a commercial pact with the Sovereignty of Tuxcali. High Ground has been terraformed into a continental world. So we can now begin the colonization here. I can't remember if I had turned out a ship for it. Looks like I did. So if I go to colonize high ground, yeah, there's that, that one right there. The Prosperity 5 is docked. And we are just going to name this colony high ground. At Noran Kingdom... Construction complete. At Norin Kingdom has pledged secret fealty to us. It's a shame the United Nations of Earth terminated theirs, because that would be two that I could get over to my side. Leffingwell Station has finished its habitation module, giving me an additional district slot over here on Leffingwell. New species variant available went ahead and converted the one young Furbanite I had because that particular colony is going to want to turn out more soon. I'd been holding off until I got more to convert, but he got to the point where I needed to convert him. There are empires preparing to declare war on us. The Soran want to declare war in one year. That's not going to happen because the Soran is now in the Allied Independent Systems, and we are at a truce for five more years. One of our Farine slaves was sold on the slave market for about 10,000 energy credits. Now, I'd been keeping track of which ones I had sold from where. So that one was from Dawnlight. And during my next maintenance cycle, I will see about mm -hmm. uploading another Farine, even though it takes an excruciating long time to navigate that interface. Font of Knowledge is just about to fall. Hopefully it'll fall before January. Yeah, it's definitely going to fall before January. Hell, it might fall before uh, 
December. Ground objective secured. It did. So this is going to switch over in December. We've got 94 unemployed Queptilium here. And 51 synthetics being purged. We'll get one synthetic purge before it flips over to be the Latrepians. The Bulwark Prefabs has timed out with the Latrepians. Now that's a 75% reduction, I believe, in cost and upkeep for platforms. So I might see a jump in my energy credit deficit. That was another reason I decided to start selling slaves. Yeah, if we go to contacts, yeah, 75% reduction in build cost and upkeep. So that's going to make it a little bit more expensive considering how many platforms I have. Now they're not getting booted out despite being decloaked. Adnorum Imperium must have open borders with us. Or we haven't closed our borders to them. See, they have closed their borders to us, but we have not closed our borders to them. So we're just decloaking them. That's okay. They can send their science vessels in. I don't care. I was debating whether or not I wanted to shuffle some pops over to the font of knowledge just to get rid of some a little faster. But I don't really have, apart from like Praku and Vareen and the likes, a large amount I'd want to get rid of. And that would just be a lot of trouble me having to locate which ones, so I'm just not going to worry about it and keep declining them as I have been. But we should lose control of this. The ancient precursor state of Queptilium Archivist has met its final demise at the hands of its enemies. What the fall of this once great empire will mean for galactic politics remains to be seen. So we'll move... Uh, Hippogriff is actually going to end up being a Kepteron. We'll just move these two over to... Polygar for now and move our army to the nearest colony, Pelops, and just land there. As our pioneers have made planet fall. As soon as it kicks over to December. So we've started colonizing high ground. As soon as it kicks over to December, we're going to lose that colony. Let's see, high ground is right near Naritum. It should actually be earlier than Naritum on the list, I believe, because it is an actual planet or colony and not a habitat. There's Naritum. We'll just adjust its position on the list. And I actually did that wrong. We need to push it above Naritum. So I should have adjusted Durkheim. We lost administrative control of the font of knowledge. I'm fine with that. Yeah, now our energy credits are really draining because of the amount of platforms we have. So I really need to keep my energy credits up by selling things. Uh, I'll probably be selling alloys and consumer goods and just keeping them at 75k. Anything that gets over 75k I'll sell. I'll probably end up selling some exotic gases and rare crystals and keeping them around a thousand. Might even sell some Zro. And just keep funding my energy credits till I can get them to build back up or get my naval capacity up to where the maintenance cost is reduced. Yeah, we're losing 3,000 energy credits a month now. Citizens Alliance of Orkham Fung has embraced cybernetics. They now have the Savelli Claris. I ended up canceling a habitation module that was under construction at the Novalis station. It was almost done, but I needed the influence because what I am doing is renegotiating the deal with the Latrepians so they are no longer a bulwark. 
so I do not have to subsidize them so much. That will cut down on my deficit. In addition, they will end up paying me some energy credits. Now this is going to tank their loyalty even further uh, at this point. I don't really care if they turn against us. It will give me an opportunity to wipe some of their planets uh, and possibly eliminate them entirely and come back in and retake the area. Uh, though I might put some claims on certain areas just to make sure that the hierarchy of Moffat and others don't move in. But we would be able to retake some of their areas like over here. I would definitely put claims over here and in Octurus and anywhere else that they are interrupting my empire. Uh, the two systems here and I would probably reclaim this section just so I could uh, have a contiguous empire again. I also have gifted 10,000 alloys to the Veterisians because I, I looked at all of their colonies. They're generating a good amount of unity. So I believe it is the alloys that is the bottleneck for them to complete the Dyson Sphere. If they begin construction of the Dyson Sphere after this gift, I'm going to mobilize and subjugate them. So I will be making use of my armies a few more times because I plan to subjugate them. Uh, I will also take over Trappist. I already have a claim on it, but I will end up getting Trappist and getting rid of the Holy Sildoran League and just occupying the rest of their territory. Though I may throw a claim on Bombala. Yeah, I don't currently have a claim on it, but I may throw a claim on Bambala to get it back because it was originally Bag's Holdings and wipe it clean. They would have to move their capital elsewhere. <laughs> but that would leave them with just this area down here and they would become my protectorate. And I will allow them to finish the megastructure, giving them 10,000 alloys every time it's just about done so they can continue to to uh, complete it and then integrate them if they don't start the integration of uh, the Dyson sphere after this gift I'm still mobilizing for a quick war before the peace treaty ends yeah see there they want to declare war on us in 2469 and I think we still have until like 73 or 74 and I will end up subjugating the Tindra Sun who are upgrading their Dyson Sphere. And again, I can gift them with medals if they end up having problems. And during the subjugation war for them, I will throw a claim on the next Nexus, the Verzak, and eliminate those two. I may also throw some claims over here to get this area. Or more than likely, rather than claims, let's see, what does a claim cost me? 33 oh, that's actually not that bad but I think I can build rebuild an outpost cheaper so what I could do uh, is just actually no they'll still get the area unless I claim it because they already have outposts and stuff here but I'll probably end up wiping this world just to cut down on the population I'm going to have to deal with when I integrate them. This one has 123. It's one of their Forge Worlds, though. That may create problems for them. They got two for big Forge Worlds over here. Wiping those may create problems for them to complete this, but I have sufficient alloys I could gift them. Because I will have enough alloys for a stage in like three months. But we'll see how the deals are received. Science Division reports a new breakthrough. We sold a Praku on the slave market for 8000 That was on Rhea. Now I'll end up replacing that during my maintenance cycle, but I do need to go ahead and update that Rhea has one less surplus Praku. That was the only surplus Praku it had. 
Thermodynamic yield control. With the chemical reaction tightly controlled by missile board microprocessors, warhead detonations can be tuned for maximum effect for local conditions at the time of impact. And now we will go for high density munitions. Let's see, do I have a propulsions expert? I do. Now that shaved seven months, six months off of that, so that was definitely worth swapping out. Now we did lose about three levels for a research assistant, but that's fine. The Vidurician League accepted the 10,000 alloys. 9 of the Trepians is now a vassal. They are giving us 1,500 energy credits, just about, and still giving us research. Other than that, we dropped them down to only joining our defensive wars. So now they will not participate in our offensive wars. We won't have problems with that. Now that is going to have an impact on the stability of my colonies, but the 5%, it's going to end up being like 3% resources from jobs on a lot of colonies, and I will be able to correct that eventually. None of them should get into stability issues. All right, we're back to positive energy credits again. The upkeep of my defense platforms quadrupled when we lost that deal because I was only paying a quarter of the price. And now with the new subsidies and not subsidizing them so much anymore, we're back to positive with the amount of defense platforms I have. And the month is rolled over. Let's see if they've started. Not yet. We'll check them again in next month. And if they haven't started by then, I guess I'm going to have to wait and see Construction if they do anything complete. in April, but we can begin mobilizing over to the Tender Zone if they haven't started by next month. Chatib Station is now fully switched over to be a shipyard with all of the modules and buildings that it requires. Hisman Protectors declared war on the sovereignty of Tuxcali. Mm. It's unfortunate that the Star Realm of Shar and the Soran are both in the Federation. We can't jump on their backs. Yeah, if we look at this war, they're at war with the majority of the galaxy at this point. Yeah, the Soran and the Star Realm of Shar and of course the entire alliance involved. So everybody is currently at war with the Hisman protectors at this point, unfortunately. And this would be a great opportunity for me to see some territory, but that's not going to be possible. We cannot declare war until four more years have passed. And this war will be over by then with the sheer forces they have to bear on the Hisman protectors. Are you guys still trying to um, raid me? Yes. There's a little 40k raiding fleet that I would eat. Meshbin Galactic Coalition broke off the research agreement with the Ethereum State. And we only have about two years left on our megastructures both the one we are building a foundation for and the final stage of the strategic coordination center. All right, let's have a look at the Federation League. They still have not begun upgrading the Dyson Sphere. So we're going to have to give them a little more time, it appears. I am going to begin mobilizing to subjugate 
the tender zone. Because if we declare war on them, we're only dealing with them and their allies before somebody else snags them up and they join the allied independent systems, we need to subjugate them. Now, I will need claims on the next nexus. That will cost 45. And the Verzak. That will also cost 45. So I'm going to need to bank a little bit of influence for claims there. And we are pretty much just going to be using our mercenaries to deal with this because I'm still reinforcing fleets. We'll send the big boys. Let's see, where are my mercenaries? Bastion Devils will be the ones that go to Verzak. Manticore Stormlords. There's no gateways or fleets over here, so they can sweep up that. Manticore Stormlords will be the ones that go for the next Nexus. And so all of my others will head to Radathi. I guess I should say both of my others. It appears I only have four mercenary fleets at this time. And of course the Palpatine... We'll start here. Actually, no. We'll start with the next Nexus. We'll get rid of the robots. And my armies need to relaunch from Pelops. And head to Radathi because we have to actually occupy to subjugate. Now, I'd like to get both claims before I actually declare war. Next month, I could get one. So it will be January before I start this war because next month I could throw down one of the claims. In October... No, I could start it in July. I could do one claim now and one claim in July because in October I do need to have Influence Bank to renew a sleeper cell. But yeah, we can push in here in July and reconquer this or subjugate this territory. But do we really need claims? If we if I end up sweeping their planets, they cease to exist. I don't think I really need the claims. Cuz they're both little one system empires, nobody else can get to them before I could. What I need to do is churn out a couple of constructors to head over this way, and as soon as I obliterate them, move a constructor in and start claiming that territory, and same for this one. That would be cheaper than the claims. It's hard to tell. Let me get a constructor and see what it would cost to build a outpost here. Oh, I can't even test it. But here at Aiden Starbase, it's not doing anything else, we'll turn out a couple of constructors. And we can get them in position. Now it's going to take a little bit of time for our fleets to get in position. Three months. Four months for the Kappa Privateers. They can be late to the party. Or we could wait four months. Yeah, we could wait until July. And we will have fully integrated the Panquisha province by then. So I will also need Influence Banked to start another integration. So it does look like we'll be doing the experiment with wiping them out and rebuilding the outpost. Because we know the claim costs 45. 50 base. The colony in the star base makes it 100 and the reductions we get drops it down to 45. Now this is one step away from our systems. It's connected to Taurus. 
So I think it would only cost us about 25 to build a outpost and the same for this one. And we will see. Blocker cleared. That would be the active volcano on Sahat Kasim. Manticore Armada paid dividends. Small amount of minerals, energy, and food. Let's do a quick check over here at... They still have not begun upgrading the Dyson Sphere. Now this is originally their space. Yeah, there are no claims on it whatsoever. So they took it, uh, they colonized it and nobody has taken it away from them. So they had to be the ones to start the Dyson Sphere's frame. But they are not upgrading it. Odd. Destinicon has become my second Ecumenopolis to switch over to the new slaves. That's primarily because it is all admin and research. So there weren't many slaves to be had, just a handful of Samolans and Canadolans and a few Furbanites. Now it doesn't have its full allotment of Philodolans yet. That's fine. It is producing Philodolans twice as fast as I decline species, so they will fill up. But as soon as it gets its amenities under control and it only needs like one extra servant to do that then it can start shipping philodolans off world since it's going to be producing them twice as fast as it needs them to help some of my other colonies get their amenities in order also losing the bulwark had another effect that i wasn't anticipating and that was the cost of star bases specifically the upgrades for my orbital rings upgrading from a tier one to a I mean tier two to a tier three did cost 97 now it costs 127 influence so that you know I'm not worried about the cost of the alloys going up it was primarily the cost of the influence reduction I was getting. That probably didn't seem to affect the habitation modules. They still have the same reduced cost as do the buildings. It was just the upgrades for stations that were affected. Now that would also affect the upgrade for my regular space stations as well in alloy cost, but alloys are not an issue. We're about two months away from integrating Pankisha province. I haven't gotten another queued up yet. I didn't save up the influence. It's gonna take about 53. So in July, I can set up another one, probably the archives or Citadel Research Institute. I wanna hold off on United Miravandium for at least a year or two, even though they should be the next one I do because they are the one that is currently losing loyalty because of the benefits of the strategic resources I'm getting a 15% increase from them as soon as that treaty expires and I see what it's doing to my economy then I will decide about ending our relationship as a prospectorium and reduce them back to vassal or actually it would be protectorate because they're so weak and integrate them we sold an ignerval slave 6600 i did pick up speaking of money i did pick up another mercenary company the Kappa Devils were available, so I went ahead and hired them. That leaves three mercenary companies in my borders that are currently rented by others. 
The Hierarchy of Moffith has the Delta Corsairs, Griffin Services, and the Manticore's Armada are both Latrepian at the time, at this time. That Ignerval was on Flaxington. Looks like they're also renting the Verzak Corsairs, which would be one I would pick up when I take this war and conquer the Verzak. Now, currently, the only contract I will need to renew within the next year or two is the Cap of Privateers. They only have about two years left on their contract. And I think it cost about 20,000 energy credits to renew, so hopefully we'll sell enough slaves within the next few years to be able to renew their contract. The others are going to last at least 10 more years. Felnol built a gateway in the Drisk system. Right there. Understandable, since they had no other way to get there other than jumping from Marcas, and the computer does not seem to like to use its jump drives. Hmm, we are still losing energy credits, and the month clicked over. We sold an oxen litter. That one was on Destiny. Finally established sleeper cells with the Glossed Rohanians. Yeah, the 15 years should be sufficient. I hope to exterminate them the next time we go to war. We will go ahead and jump them back to the Venerician. There we go. Now it's fluctuated back up. I don't understand why it was still 700 down for a month. Maybe it was due to the integration. But we have now integrated Pankesia Province. Now I went ahead and planned out a little bit of what I need to do here. On this colony. One of the first things I need to do is disable the merchant slot. And then building wise, we want to disable the entertainment facility. Demolish the alloy research and hydroponics. And we can get started on our clone vat. We're actually gonna replace the moat harvesting trap. Because I'm gonna put the moat harvesting trap somewhere around here. Yeah, I think it's going to be the synthetic crystal plant that becomes the mode harvester. Because this should be the ancient refinery. Yeah, mineral will turn into the ancient refinery, then we will have the moat trap. This will become a gas extractor, and that will become a crystal. Just because I like my order to be moats, gas, and crystals because that is the order they display, and that is also the order of the refineries. You have chemical plant, exotic gas refinery, and synthetic crystal plant. So alphabetically, they would go chemical, gas, crystal. Now this should have things to decline. Yeah, I've got robots to decline. I'm only gonna get one, I think, in this cycle. So it will be next cycle before I have cleared this up to where I can actually start declining. It says it's growing a human. I actually had a human over here or pop over here. Oh, that is right. I have a whole bunch of humans that are unemployed that are rulers. So they will be hopping over here by themselves to fill up the politician jobs which is good. We have one indentured servant and all the rest are currently domestic servants. And I will need to shuffle some things around here because we're currently at 61 crime. So I will need a couple of enforcers over here to be able to keep the crime in check which may delay me getting a few more strongholds online. Matter of fact, that might be a good idea to do now. I can spare one Furbanite here. 
It is going to delay when I get my stronghold online on St. Natchbull. And I can spare one on Flaxington. Not quite as under control as I would like. We still have over 30 crime. One more should get it at a reasonable level. Destinicon can spare one. Yeah, now we're under 30 crime, and my first priority when I get a clone vat will be getting... Actually, it looks like I would need... After I get the clone vat, before I get the other buildings, I probably need to go ahead and build a precinct. And start... They have the clone vat start churning out an additional Furbanite. Because we need this crime under control. Now, another thing, Pan Keisha should be right below Magal in my list. Because it will end up being part of the Ubaria province in a day. And we can go ahead and downgrade and get rid of. Huff Station. No, not, uh, not Upgrade. <laughs> there we go. We can get rid of Huff Station, so we're not paying maintenance on it. And Keisha does not have an orbital ring. And we got a handful more transport ships that need to meet up with my fleet. Now, we might also have picked up some military ships though I doubt it. I don't think they had much in the way of a military. And some civilian ships. They didn't even have a constructor. Um, they, oh, those are the two constructors I churned out just in case I need to replace these. <laughs> star bases. I may not need to, but I... The constructors are fairly cheap for me at this point. I mean, they only cost... 80 alloys, and if I have to end up deleting them, fine. Yeah, I didn't even get any science ships from them. So Pankeisha had nothing in the way of a fleet because their starbase had no shipyard. I just realized it was all trade. No shipyard. There we go. Now it is merged with Ubaria sector. Construction complete. Your Gwudal station has completed another orbital anchorage. I think that's pretty much the limit. It's going to hang on to that last district for a generator. With a Mastery of Nature, I could get all three generator districts. And yeah, that seems like a bit of a waste. Just three generator districts. Or three industrial districts. But I, I like to make use of all the districts that I can. And even if I'm not getting the full benefit from buildings and everything for this little bit. There isn't really much else I could do with that other than, say, a city districts or industrial districts that aren't getting as much benefit. And a little bit of energy credits always helps. They've got five months left on their partial Dyson Sphere. I may wait till January. To ensure that they're working on the next stage. I don't know. Let's check and see if... No, they still haven't even begun. Yeah, you know what. Let's do it anyway. We'll be picking... Well, no, they'll, they'll be a subject for a while. But I think... Next Nexus does not have a mercenary company in here, I don't think. No. But the Verzak do. So we are going to vassalize them. Standing by to commence offensive operations. Weapons free. Repeat, weapons free. 
it'll only take about 150 to achieve our war goals. Our relative Navy strength is humongous compared to them. So we get them some exhaustion. Yeah, about 100 points from exhaustion will neutralize demanding surrender. And then we just need to come up with 50 more points from elsewhere, like occupation. So we don't have to fully occupy their area if we occupy mostly the star bases we may end up needing to take over a few planets now i will have to wait a day before i can give the orders to move in or it may update when i save and reload after doing my maintenance cycle since it does tend to recalculate things <laughs> prepare to have your assets liquidated tender zuns <laughs> That's their response to me, is to call me a Tendra's son. That sounds like what I would say to them. It would appear that when I exited the menu and then reloaded the game, that it did update that we are now at war. Yes, I can send my troops in. And order the Palpatine to bathe the planet. After it bathes that one, it's going to come over here to bathe these. We'll start with the planet. And then just work our way through the orbits bathing the habitats. This would be a good test if bathing the habitats leaves a colonizable habitat or a ruin. So the Bastion Devils head in here. And the rest of our forces will move in here. I'll delay a little bit before I send in the first army. I also eliminated the final Gandlerev from my empire, but we will be picking up more when we integrate the Osiris colonies, but there are no more Gandlerev in my empire, so we are slowly trimming down this list. Now, there are a few I'm watching that are pretty much entirely in my empire. The Bodronite and the Genlot are the last two in existence, and of course we got two Fex Klinga still left. Those also will be picked up when we get to Osiris. But this is the final Genlot and Bodronite of the galaxy. All of the Kel Nudar are pretty much in my empire, as well as the Polvanites, and all of the base species of Besedon. There is another subspecies that is running around out there. Engaging enemy station. Fortress Legionnaires are taking on this station. It does not have any platforms. We're also obliterating some transport ships. It looks like it's also the cap of privateers in there, and the just the um, cap of devils will be joining shortly. That fight should go fairly smoothly for us, as well as this one. We're bringing. 172k into a system where they have 10k and over here we have 200k where they have 40. Engaging enemy station. Fleet action underway. We got some debris in Azic already. It has no detection strength. We might be able to pop in there. I don't know. I'd rather secure it first. We lost one destroyer, one corvette. 
just about obliterated the transport fleets and flipped uh, Nathupa Station for the Latrepians. Interesting. I don't see the Latrepian flag here. I wonder why the battle shows the Latrepian flag there. Nathupa Station isn't even in here. <laughs> what the hell? That was messed up. Where is Nathupa Station? Why was it involved in the combat? It's way the hell over here. That's got to be a little bit of a glitch. That is just weird as hell that a non-mobile station from halfway across the galaxy was involved in this combat. Now we did take some damage, so we will hold here for repairs. And then we will leave one of the smaller fleets here while the others press on around here until we get all of their territory. Hopefully this war won't last very long and I can also do the war against the Veterisians. The problem is the Veterisians have a vassal. At Norum Imperium, which is fairly large, is a bulwark under them. So that's a lot of territory I would have to occupy. And we... Well, it looks like they changed their mind about declaring war on us. But we still have only about four years before a war could be renewed. So I don't want to get too involved against the... At Norum Imperium, if this fight takes too long, I'll probably hold off on that. I renegotiated the deal with the archives to be able to integrate them. We will be subsidizing a small amount of their basic resources and advanced resources. But we will be getting a little bit of research in return. I don't know if it's already been included here in the subsidies. We may end up losing a little bit of energy credits right now. But let's go ahead and begin the integration. It will take two years. We completed an orbital ring in the Kanagi system. That would be the orbital ring around Asher. Now, Asher is currently undergoing its arcology project, so I'm not going to put habitation districts on here until that completes. But I can throw some anchorages on here to reduce how much I am over on my naval capacity a little bit more. That will also help with energy credits. It's a lot of battleships. Did they just flee? <laughs> we obliterated the Derivator fleet and their transport fleet. So they are without... We actually blew up one more destroyer than they had. So apparently they got a reinforcement midway through the fight. But we now control their system. They can't churn out more reinforcements. We will send the Manticore Stormlords to Kide for repairs. And then, actually, we'll, we'll go all the way to Radathi. That way we can stick with the Hyperlane network as far as we can. Actually, we could go all the way to Trab now, I think. Yeah, we can use the Hyperlane all the way to Trab. 
and just repair a trap when it is online. Now we did, uh, Manticore Stormlords didn't lose a ship doing that, by the way. We sold a Farine for almost 10,000 energy credits. Good, we needed energy. That Farine was on Flaxington. I did make a mistake by selling multiple slaves on Flaxington because Flaxington was at a threshold for, for its extra jobs. Yeah, it's dropped down to 98 now, so we did lose one gas plant engineer job when a couple of the slaves sold. And now I'm, that's the last slave I had on the market for there. I'm going to wait until I get to 101 before I start selling slaves here again. There's only one surplus farine left there. A handful of surplus Ignervol. Mm -hmm. The special reaction flotilla popped back up here. Fleet action underway. A hundred and thirty K in fleet strength versus my se uh, eight hundred. Yeah, eight hundred and ten. This is not going to go well for them. We got another 100k there. And another 50k back there. We have connected our capital to the next nexus. For as long as it lasts. And I've got another 100k, 176k on its way over here. Science Division report success. Tracking implants. Further advancements in the field of subdermal implants can provide detailed information regarding the movements and actions of the implanted. Now, I could knock out the Galactic Stock Exchange and actually build my own. Yeah, let's go ahead and knock that out because it's fairly cheap and will knock out fairly quickly. Oh, and I did forget to check. That is statecraft. Let us cloak. And let's move there to scavenge projects in the system. They are rapidly melting. Bastion Devils did take quite a bit of losses mainly in the frigates, taking on Nathup. Nathupa Station was involved in this combat again. <laughs> I think it's just going to be showing Nathupa Station anytime I flip a Citadel. But, um, yeah, we obliterated several of their fleets. There are six cruisers and seven battleships still out there, as well as four frigates and eight corvettes. <laughs> And since they ported away, they will return. We are going to hold here until we're sure they're dead, because this is where they will keep returning usually. I think I may have the Manticore Stormlords go to Romston to repair, because I do need a fleet to stay here in Silage. And after we go to Romston, we will sweep these systems so that they can't pop up over there. We lost 15 frigates, 16 frigates, just 16 frigates, taking out a Titan, a battleship, a cruiser, eight corvettes, three destroyers, and two more battleships. And I want these fleets to repair. Oh, there's another fleet inbound that we will end up facing before we repair. 
We are halfway through charging this weapon, so another month and a half, and it will begin to fire. Or actually, another uh, month and a half, and it should have fired by then. Yeah, I think we've only got like half a month left. I mean, a month left of charging the weapon. And then it will be one month to fire. Fleet action underway. Let's watch this fleet rapidly melt. We lost eight more frigates, taking out four battleships, four destroyers, and 23 corvettes. Not a bad trade, especially since I don't have to rebuild these. These are mercenary fleets. <laughs> We have connected our capital to the Verzac. Yeah, we're 75% through, through charging. So, yeah, in a little over a month, we should obliterate the next Nexus. We're about a year away from our megastructures being completed. Winter has been terraformed. Now, I have a colony ship being turned out here in Taziad. It should be out in about a week. There it is. So now I can begin the colonization of winter. They have an unusual tendency to want your first colony in a system to be named the, over after the system prime. But the prime planet is the first in the orbit. Yerbdar 1 would be Yerbdar prime. Even if this is the only colony in the system, calling it Yerubdar Prime is wrong. It would be called Yerubdar 3. Because you base on outgoing orbits. I got a little bit of delay on my sleeper cells. I used up my influence for other things during my maintenance. Rakuten Imperium broke their commercial pact with the Tendrazun. This should be done before December. We have constructed the gateway in the Algarab system. I'm going to let it advance another day so I can update the trade route from Algarab. Now all of my stations should be connected. I don't think I have any that can't reach to Neb. We got the orbital ring in the Rakron system. That would be around... Rodoman. I'll go ahead and get it started on an anchorage for now. It is supposed to be an anchorage. Okay. And of course I need the platforms. Can I get a... Yes, I can get a hangar started. Now this one should be on its way to Adavarish to do the next one. I do have the other one currently idle. It's going to be starting at Gandlerev and working its way out. Getting all the ones over here, Jotunheim, and then probably hopping over to get Kelnuda. And I did rename a couple of the homeworlds because they shared the same name with the species, which made searching my species list a pain in the butt because if I look for Kel Nudar, it would stop any time there was a species in the list. So I changed the name of Kel Nuda and Fel Null to Fel Na. The Uthabul and Ganlariv, I kept the same. What I did is just added a C to the end so I can find the colony just by adding an extra letter to it. And I also renamed... I had some habitats that were called worlds, like Schimmel's World, Fitzroy's World, and I just changed them to Station. Because it didn't make sense to call something a world when it's a habitat. 
We sold a Praku for 16,000. That was on Spring Rain, and Spring Rain is where I need to queue up a new one. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So you get to see the nice buggy interface as I try to sell a slave of a Praku on Spring Rain. Alright, good. Praku is at the top. That makes this a little easier. Ah, good. Spring Rain's on the initial list. That makes this a lot easier. Now, if I can just get it to scroll down where I can target one. You. There we go. So I've got another one on the market to sell. Um, I'm trying to offload some of the Praku there on Spring Rain so I can shift the gene clinic over to a research facility. It looks like the station disappeared. We'll give it a, a day or two. It might wait until the month update. We have claimed a new world. Yeah, there's no station in the system. But it says it, it looks like it says it's mine. The Azak system is not fully surveyed. All right, after you finish the debris, we need to survey the system. You can go ahead and get in orbit. 52 to build a station there. I thought it was down to 25. I was mistaken. It's because I'm not in a uh, expansionist, I think. No, expansionist only affects the metal cost. Now, how much would it cost me to put a claim here? 90 now that we're at war. Azak 3 was purged of all life. Now, right now, it's still showing the next nexus as being in control of this system. Even though the star base has gone away. We'll have to see what happens. High ground is established here in Ulus. And unfortunately, we have a science director. I will leave them in the science director slot until I get ready to upgrade the planetary admin, at which point I will close out that slot because I will get an additional. Same thing for the merchant. When I go to reassemble ship shelter, I will get two politicians and I can close out these two jobs then. But I do need to shift something over here to decline. And I believe for Dara has plenty of spare Habenti. So we'll shift one Habenti over. And I will handle, uh, I can go ahead and get started there on high ground on Oh, we have a lot of fortresses here. Let's disable these for now. We can go ahead and demolish the paradise. I'm not going to need housing. And disable. This only has a little bit of energy credit cost. We're going to demolish the military academy. So we have a hypercoms and the research institute. Just go ahead and start here, building a clone vat, until I figure out how many of these buildings I'm going to end up keeping. So we can build a clone vat and then the gene clinics and get this place started. And of course I will need to shuffle some pops over. We sold an ox and a litter. That one was at Hawksworth. And I'll worry about add, uh, updating that during my maintenance cycle. 12,000. Right now, I want to see what's going to happen with Azax 
since I have pretty much destroyed the empire that was there. The next nexus should be no more. Yeah, they're gone. So let's exit to the menu and reload the game. That should do an update and I should be able to see if I can take over the system. Now, oddly enough, we didn't get a pop-up about the next Nexus being destroyed. I wonder if it's waiting till January to do that, but I would like to expedite the ability to do something with that system. Yes, it is now unclaimed. So as soon as we finish our surveys of it, we can take over the system. Looks like there are still abandoned stations here that belong to me. So we're going to have a similar issue with the Verzac when we take care of that. I think I may divert. Let's go ahead and start surveying. We'll go ahead and divert um, a couple of fleets of ships to make this quicker. Basically all the ones from Acropolis. And we want to return to assist research when we are done. Just to get the surveys done quicker so that I can take over the system before somebody else gets in here. Well, we've already got them to 100% exhaustion. We just need 47 more points of occupation. Bastion Devils are now fully repaired. So I am going to send them to this system and move Manticore Stormlords into here. Well, they're almost done repairing. I'll let them finish repairing before I relocate them. It's like they've only got a few ships left to repair. Fortress Legionnaires is showing at full. Yeah, Manticore Stormlords just finished repairing, so we will uh, park them in this system to watch for their fleets popping back up. And since Fortress Legionnaires is showing 100%, Well, their frigates are not fully repaired. It's just their hull, not their armor. That's what it is. So we haven't gotten the... Uh, and they're about to send another 50k fleet in this way. So we'll just hold here until we actually get the message that we've been repaired. Alright, we're going to repurchase the uh, research aid agreement with the curators. Our logistic support contract has been terminated. Now I need to find which one requires the most because I was going to change who I was getting it from. I remember that. They're at 70. Yeah, we're going to get our logistical support from the Kappa Devils this time to get it all. Actually, no. It's the ones that somebody else has that I need to worry about. Like Arbitraeus, Griffin Services. We have to have at least a 30 to increase it. There is the one in the Kel Nudar. Delta Corsairs, we have a 55. We will get a logistical services from them. That way we can get their reputation up a little faster to be able to get the fleet from whoever else has it. And the other one would be Vilth. Yeah, we need 10 more opinion from them. So the other two that we need to get the fleets from, we need 10 more opinion. So we're probably going to end up giving, subsidizing them so that they can build a bigger fleet or something. And, of course, we're going to be sharing our tech with everybody. We can activate a relic. I could get a boatload of energy credits. Not really an issue now that I'm selling slaves again. So let's improve 
Zark and his pilgrims. You're cold and we are here. May the enemies of Zarkland breed ugly children. May they choke on their nutrients. May their clothing disintegrate at an opportune and embarrassing moments. May their ocular organs spontaneously combust. May their... Yeah, Zarkland wills it. So we have a new Zarkland's Pilgrim fleet that should pop up over here. That we can send to where we have Zarkland's Pilgrims. Which, honestly, I can't remember where they are. Maybe I did relocate them back here. Yes. Even though I have the mercenary company, I relocated them back here. And let's have them... Merging would exceed the limit. Alright, so your home base will be a fill-in station. Actually, it's easier just to right-click and set it there, and then say, return home. And then we'll probably just merge as many of these over as we can, and then this one will become Zarkland's Pilgrim's Reinforcements. When we merge, uh, when we shift the ships over, we'll have some to replace. And I guess we're going to need a new relic soon. And it has been another five years. Now I have a brand new gaming rig that I need to get set up. I just wanted to finish recording this episode and editing and posting and all of that on my old computer before I shift over to the new machine. So I'm going to be doing that, um, getting it set up downloading and using the cloud to get my save over there but thank you all for watching and hopefully we'll see you next time